2.1, Certificated Public Employee Appointment Employment. Item 2.2, Classified Public Employee Appointments Employment. 2.3, Public Employee Discipline, Dismissals, Releases, and Leaves. To item 2.4, Negotiations, Updates, and item 2.5, Real Property, uh, Real Estate, the Towers. And with that, we'll return. Good night, everyone. Tonight, I uh, want to welcome everyone to tonight's meeting. Uh, board president couldn't be here, so I'll be chairing the meeting tonight. Just a couple reminders. If you wish to speak on an item on the agenda, uh, make sure that you submit uh, one of the speaking cards prior to the item starting. Otherwise, we will not be taking them in. Okay. The second thing is if you uh, need translation services, we do have a translator. She can provide you with the proper equipment. Okay, so with that, we're going to go ahead and get started. Bienvenidos a todos. Uh, les quiero dar la bienvenida uh, de parte de aquí de la mesa directiva del distrito escolar. Nuestra presidenta no puede estar presente esta noche, so hoy yo voy a estar encargada de correr la junta. Si necesitan o quieren uh, hablar uh, en uno de los temas que se va a estar cubriendo hoy, asegúrense de llenar una de las tarjetas antes de, de, de que ese tema comience. Si recibo una tarjeta después de, de que ya hemos empezado con el tema, no se, va, no se les va a dar la oportunidad de, de hablar. So asegúrense de que la, la sometan antes. Y por último, uh, si necesitan traducción, tenemos a nuestra traductora Virginia que les puede dar el aparato necesario. Y con eso vamos a comenzar. I would like to ask uh, Jeff Ursino to lead us into the Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, item 3.3, .3, superintendent comments. Yes, thank you. Well, we've had some excellent events over the last two weeks, and so I want to speak to two of them. On Thursday, May 17th, we had our first annual Latino Youth Film Oscar Award Ceremony. So hemos tenido algunos eventos excelente, excelentes en las últimas dos semanas. Me gustaría compartir dos de ellos. El viernes 17 de mayo tuvimos nuestra primera ceremonia de premios Oscar de Cine Joven, Juvenil Latino. These dedicated students have been part of a year-long film class taught by film writer mentors from the Latino Film Youth Institute. Esos estudiantes dedicados han participado por un año en una clase de cine, de cine impartada por mentores de escritores de cine del Cine Juventil del Instituto Latino de Cine. And these students have transformed their narrative stories from the beginning of the year into short films with the guidance of their teachers, Mr. Ricardo Reyes and Ms. Lucy Bassor. Esos estudiantes han transformado sus historias narrativas desde el comienzo del año en cortometrajes con la guía de sus maestros, el señor Ricardo Reyes y la señora Lucy Bassor. Then, on Friday, May 18th, we had our first annual PVUSD College Signing Day, where 150 seniors from throughout the district came together to celebrate their accomplishments. El viernes 18 de mayo, llevamos a cabo nuestro primer día de firma de la Universidad de Nivel de Estricto Escolar del Valle de Pajro, donde 150 alumnos del último año de todo el distrito se reunieron para celebrar sus logros. And almost 300 students will be attending one of 56 four-year colleges throughout the nation in the fall, along with hundreds who will be attending junior colleges, trade schools, and the military. 
casi 300 alumnos de último año asistieron a uno de los 56 colegios de cuatro años en toda la nación en el otoño, junto con cientos que van a asistir a un colegio de dos años, escuelas comerciales y la militar. Gracias. Thank you. Bring it back to the board. Any governing board comments? Karen? I have to write it down. <laughs> um, so the next day after the last board meeting, I went to the Women's Farm Bureau lunch, which was at a ranch um, on Coralitos Road. So of course I bicycled there too. And um, I brought my backpack with a skirt in it and a hat, which everybody wears, so I look more dignified, not just my bicycle clothes. <laughs> um, and oh, actually, I, they, gave us, they gave us a big bag of vegetables, so I stuffed as many as I could in my backpack, as much as I could, not all of them, but I and went home, my backpack was stuffed with vegetables. <laughs> I also went to the meeting of um, Migrant Head Start, my, the policy committee meeting, and we haven't started our really big meetings yet, but we will start them, I think, soon, our big meetings that we have with all the parents in the Migrant Head Start through the summertime. I also went to the DLAC meeting, um, and um, w they discussed a lot the LCAP and the eight goals that we have in LCAP and what all these students, teachers, and parents uh, DLAC included, have wanted in the DLAC. And then Dr. Rodriguez is there and talked about Paso a Paso and also all the programs that parents can get involved with and to learn about, including graduations, um, information for undocumented parents or for parents, immigrant parents, and um, a lot of other programs that they, that parents can learn about. Um, <laughs> is that right? Is that my, am I correct? <laughs> okay. I also went to an open house with Pajaro Middle School, and actually on the same exact day was the open house for Radcliffe, which is another one of my schools, and it's always a problem that they don't get their open houses on days that I can go to all of them. Um, but it was a really good one because they had, um, they had small band, um, they had little groups that came up and, and, and played band instruments, which was pretty cool. And um, they had some people who got up and sang, so that was really nice. And then, we, then I go to every single classroom to try to visit all, this, all the classrooms. Um, and then I also went to the retirement party today um, where there's retirees that, are, that have been here 40 years or more, 40 years, it's incredible. And then all the retirees that are uh, leaving, and there was everybody was there. I mean, all of you know everybody on here, out here, <laughs> and Kim was there, and um, and so we gave all the 40-year people special presents and all the retirees presents as well. And and the people got up and talked about w all the wonderful things that they did that they did, and I loved to listen to them because. It, it made me feel like I, I, I kind of got to know each retiree a little bit better by hearing all the stuff that they had accomplished when they were working. So that was, that was fun, too. Thanks. <laughs> yeah? Uh, retirement's in the air. Um, on Saturday night, uh, my wife and I got to go to Mr. Detterman, who is the principal of Mar Vista, to his retirement party. Um, that his retirement party and what was really great to see was it wasn't just um, teachers but it was parents students uh, and and teachers from a 38 year career in um, in education and you know when you get to meet people and get to know people inside the district and you get to meet them outside the district it's interesting but what I really appreciated was the students standing up the students stand up saying the effect that Mr. Detterman or Dick Detterman um, had on their lives. I've said this for a long time, and I'll, and I'll say it for a long time forward, moving forward. Great schools really are about teachers who are committed to it, a community that's committed to the schools, and to students that are committed to 
their education. And um, after seeing the great turnout that Mr. Detterman had on Saturday night, um, we're losing we're losing one of those teachers, one of those administrators, one of those educators who are really committed to the well-being of their students. Thank you. Perla. Hi everyone, um, I'm Perla, I'm the student trustee, and I have been the student trustee uh, for this academic year, um, and I believe this is my last meeting here, and I just wanted to thank um, the board members and the community for allowing this opportunity for me to be up here. Um, I also wanted to give a little announcement. Uh, I go to Watsonville High School, and tomorrow uh, all the seniors are gonna have their um, community action project presentations, and a community action project is basically, uh, over the course of the year, seniors choose a problem that they think um, they should take action on. And throughout the year, they um, get in uh, contact with community members or they do something uh, around the school. For example, I wanted to bring back a marching band um, to Watsonville High, and I've been working with um, a lot of the middle schools and music programs at Watsonville High to get that going. Um, so we're gonna be presenting things like that, and there's a lot of like environmental uh, issues that they will be presenting on, and so on. And we wanted to invite everyone, um, the board members, I know I sent out an email, maybe you got it, um, and everybody else in the community, you guys are welcome to um, come tomorrow. The presentations are gonna be uh, tomorrow, all day, uh, from 8.30 to 2.30, and then on Friday from 8.30 to 2.30. So you guys are all invited. Uh, I will be attending UCLA. Congratulations. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Congratulations, Perla. We're very, very proud of you. Good job. I want to thank you for your efforts in leading, um, being a leader on your campus for music education. As you know, this board, um, including Leslie DeRose, who's not here, and I, in particular, have um, tried to spearhead bringing music back into our district. And so that is our dream, as well as having marching bands again at all schools. So thank you for your efforts there. And congratulations and best wishes as you head off to UCLA. Um, we're getting ready here in the district for the best time of the year. It's the time when all of us um, feel very satisfied to look out overseas of young people who are graduating and going off, um, to most, many of them, most of them actually to college and many to careers. And um, so we're really looking forward to that um, over the next couple of weeks, starting tomorrow night with our adult school graduation. Um, I did thank you for announcing, but I did attend the Farm Bureau luncheon. It was beautiful. Agriculture, I was there. I know, did you see me? <laughs> I did see you. Um, I attended uh, Valencia Open House, Valencia Home and School Club, where I met with a great group of parents who are very excited and interested in um, building things for their school. Um, and today we did have an amazing retirement for many people who have been in the district 40 years, 30 years, 20 years. Um, and we're sad to see them go, but we wish them a very restful and successful retirement. Thank you. Willie? No? Okay. Thank you. And now for our favorite part of um, all meetings, uh, we're moving on to student recognitions. And I would like to call up David Gonzalez from Pacific Coast Charter along with his family and everyone else who's here to support him. Good evening, Dr. Rodriguez and members of the board. Um, Pacific Coast Charter School and I are proud to announce that David Gonzalez is our student of the year. David has many, had many obstacles to overcome as one of a triplicate, triplet with a single mom. He had many struggles with social pressures in a comprehensive high school. But David says he enjoys PCCS because it is very welcoming and says you can focus on school and not the distractions all around you. He's been with us since the ninth grade. He's a senior this year. One teacher says of David that he has been in on my on-site classes for college prep 
While at student at PCCS for over the past three years, he has consistently demonstrated a quiet determination to persevere even when the material at times has been difficult. He's a model student arriving to class on time with his work completed. As David has matured, he has modestly stepped into the role of a leader and can often be seen taking the time to help his fellow students understand a math concept. David is a true example of a student who has thrived during his time here at PCCS. He is organized, motiva motivated, follows through with his responsibilities, and has a great work ethic. He has more than 99 hours of community service. David volunteered for over a year at his dojo and is now a paid instructor in martial arts. He is also a model for a clo local clothing band, uh, brand, it's called The Ville and has helped them to develop their website and is working on producing a commercial for them. David, once an English language learner, is now reclassified as a fluent English proficient and has a 3.96 GPA. <clears throat> David will be attending Cal Poly Pomona next year along with his two brothers. I'd also like to announce that he will be recognized as a valedictorian at our graduation ceremony. David has earned the respect of both staff and his peers, and we're very proud of him. Thank you. David, on behalf of Pajaro Valley Unified School District, I'm very pleased to um, announce your student of the year and provide you with this special um, recognition of your amazing success. We really want you to keep up the good work. We're proud of you. Congratulations on Cal Poly Pomona. I know you'll do a great job there. And have a wonderful time. Have fun. <laughs> So before, before you go to the, the picture, I just wanted to um, say, David, that we, we were hoping that you would come again to see us um, because we wanted to congratulate you on the article on the Pajaronian um, for the triplets, so yourself and your two brothers, and reaching that black belt and all the recognition that you do within the community. So congratulations on that. Congratulations, David. Um, so next up, we have Joseph Daniel Espinosa from Wattsville Charter School of the Arts. So if I can have him come up along with his family and anyone here to support him. Good evening, Vice President Orozco, Dr. Rodriguez, esteemed board and cabinet members and fellow community members. My name is Amy Thomas and I'm the proud principal of the Watsonville Charter School of the Arts. It is my pleasure to present to you tonight our student of the year, Joseph Daniel, we call him JD Espinoza. JD is a current eighth grade student who has been enrolled at WCSA since kindergarten. Throughout his years at WCSA, JD has overcome enormous obstacles, and as you can see, has grown taller than me. Isn't hard. He has not let the diagnosis of autism hold him back. He was virtually nonverbal until he received a one-on-one -on -one instructional assistant in the fifth grade. JD knew, JD knew everything about weather and airplanes, and slowly began talking about these with trusted adults. Since the fifth grade, JD has made enormous social, academic, and athletic growth and is tra transitioning to high school fully mainstreamed. JD is passionate about playing football, basketball, 
and watching professional sports with his family. His favorite memories from his tenure at WCSA has been going to Washington, D.C. and New York City with his fellow eighth graders, working on ceramics during art and participating in middle school sports with his friends. He's extremely excited about playing freshman football for the Watsonville High School Wildcats. WCSA would like to think, thank J.D. Espinoza, his family, Ken and Lily Espinoza, his sister, Camila, and his instructional assistant, Jasmine Guerrero, for trusting us with enriching and educating J.D.'s life each and every day for the past nine years. We're so proud of you, J.D., and we cannot wait to see what the future brings to you. I'm going to leave you with J.D.'s favorite quote from Michael Jordan, which symbolizes his strength, his perseverance, and dedication. I can accept failure, but I cannot, I cannot accept not trying. Thank you all for honoring Joseph Daniel Espinosa. I actually, JD wanted to say something to you, but got really nervous. So I'm gonna read it for you, okay? This is from JD, so this is JD speaking. I would like to thank my teachers, Jasmine, and my fam family for supporting me. There are a lot of things I'm going to miss about WCSA, like the field trips and the sports, but I'm really excited about high school. Thank you. Uh, so I want to provide you this student of the year from the Pajaro Valley Unified School District and from our board of directors here as well. And we're so very proud of you and so is everybody out here proud of you. Yes. Uh, everybody here is proud of you too. And um, um, my daughter went to Wattsville Charter School for the Arts, and, and I bet you have some stuff at home that you made there, because I have quite a few framed pictures mm -hmm. that my daughter did when she was at the Wattsville Charter School of the Art on my walls. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you so much for all you've done and all you're going to do. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations, Joseph and family. So moving right along, item 3.5, Employee of the Month recognition. Thank you. So we have been so fortunate because we have had um, Jacob Young Financial Services that has been a partner of ours for years. And they sponsor um, not only teacher but also classified employees of the month. And they've done that now for, for years for us. And how it works is staff is nominated by their peers and then um, they're selected by a panel that's composed of former administrators and also staff. Um, and so we want to make sure that those winners can be recognized in front of their peers. Um, and um, we have um, the representative here to thank us and um, be able to represent our staff. So thank you for being here. Hi, good evening, uh, distinguished superintendent, board members, and community. Um, my name is Tina Harper. I'm from Jacob Young Financial. And tonight it is my pleasure to be here to announce the winners of the Jacob Young financial sponsored PVUSD Educator of the Month Award for the 2017-2018 school year. Um, if the five following individuals are here, um, please join me up here with your administrator. Um, I'm going to mention the Teachers of the Month first. It, Whitney Haig of um, Pacific Coast Charter, Eric Johnson of Ann Soldo Elementary, Alice Miller of Hall District Elementary, Nancy Claspill Navarro of Minty White Elementary, and Annabelle Mendez of Landmark Elementary. So Whitney Haig is the science teacher at Pacific Coast Charter, grades 9 through 12. Whitney is always preparing amazing activities and experiments for her students to make the classroom engaging and fun, but still challenging. 
She also provides a safe place in her office for students to, to stop by, joke, vent, question, or cry on her shoulder. Eric Johnson is a third grade teacher at Ann Soldo Elementary. Eric is an excellent teacher with solid classroom management and high expectations for his students. His classroom is highly structured with clear routines, posted learning intentions, and clear expectations. At the end of school year during the fifth grade promotion ceremony, students often mention Eric as one of their favorite teachers. Alice Miller is a fourth grade teacher at Hall District Elementary and Alice created a band for Hall District. <laughs> she is caring, displays an open-mindedness in her class, with her class, and a willingness to try something new. The students love the band and are excited to learn and to be at school. Nancy Classville Navarro is a resource specialist at Minty White Elementary. Nancy's been with the district for over 30 years, one of those who's retiring this year, and is responsible for delivering rigorous lessons to students with learning disabilities who are often the hardest to reach. She was a CASA volunteer who made a huge impact on one young man's life who struggled but went on to be a student at the University of California Merced. Her acts of generosity, never ending development as a professional and high expectations for all her students exemplify that one person can truly make a difference in a young person's future. And our last Teacher of the Month award uh, was given to Annabelle Mendez, who is a first grade bilingual teacher at Landmark Elementary. Annabelle goes the extra mile with a willingness to help anyone need, who needs her help. She works with her colleagues and students translating and creating materials from English to Spanish, Spanish to English, with the patience to explain every detail for them to learn and have a better understanding of the Spanish language. And so I. Kim uh, Sweeney is going to say some wonderful things about Whitney Haig. <laughs> and then I will introduce the um, Classified Employee of the Month winners after. <clears throat> Whitney has effectively mastered teaching in both the classroom and in the independent study setting. Having been in special ed for 11 years prior to coming to our site, she is keenly aware and empathetic to students' individual needs. She uses a combination of whole class, small group, and one-to-one -one instruction to ensure students comprehend the rigorous curriculum that she has to offer. She spends hours planning and preparing for lessons that will both increase the knowledge of the subject area, plus be enjoyable and very interactive. She encourages frequent communication and peer review through the use of Google Classroom. She is kind and caring in her approach, and the students love and respect her. When she is not in an individual meeting, other students flock to her open door. She never turns away a student who needs additional help and ensures that the neediest of them have meetings with her each week, which is way above and beyond the requirement. Students blossom with her support and guidance. Whitney's also our tech liaison, which requires additional meetings, trainings, and communication with all other staff. She's also our point person when a colleague needs assistance with Edgenuity, better known as E2020. She volunteers to work in our tutoring sessions several times per week. She sits in on interview panels and helps to assist us to find other outstanding staff for our school, and she's also in the process of getting yet another credential to even be more versatile and a, even a greater asset when we're planning our master schedule. As a new principal coming in and putting some new structures in place, Whitney kept an open mind and was very compassionate, understanding the rationale behind some organizational changes that needed to take place. The school community and culture of our school as a whole has benefited as Whitney keeps a positive attitude, encourages others, lends a listening ear, and discourages gossip. Both staff and students enjoy being around her. She's a role model for others. We, we have been blessed to have Whitney on our staff at Pacific Coast Charter. Thank you for your time. Okay, so we have three Classified Employee of the Month awards that we handed out this school year. Uh, Lori Hallett with the District Office Program Evaluation Office 
Freddie Villafuerte the, uh, at Ann Soldo Elementary, and Katrina Hernandez. And I know Katrina's here, as well as Victoria, so. Lori Hallett works in the Program Evaluation Office. Lori's also been with the district for over 30 years, and I believe is retiring this year as well. Although she does not have direct student contact, her pivotal support to site leaders and teachers impacts every student's testing environment. Freddie Villafuerte is the lead custodian at Ann Soldo Elementary, and I really wish he was here because he is awesome. He's a crack up. He's just great. He really connects with the students. Um, while students recognize Freddie for keeping their school clean, they probably don't realize that he makes sure that all the trash from the adjacent park is removed from behind the campus and shared parking area before they arrive for school each day. Freddie is exceptional with the students. He challenges fifth graders to a state capital competition, has donated the cost of attending outdoor school for a student to ease the financial burden for a family, and has an ease with students who can talk freely to him while encouraging him to do their best. Katrina Hernandez is the campus supervisor for Pajaro Valley Middle School. I had teenagers. <laughs> I know what they can be like, and I don't envy your job, but you're great at it. All the staff at PV spoke so highly of your talent and dealing with the students. You go above and beyond, especially when kids are troubled and need an adult who understand how hard it is to go through the teen years and to make good choices. And you also drove the fundraiser for the students going to DC. So Very congratulations. Nice. I know Victoria wants to say some wonderful things about you too. Good evening, uh, members of the board, Dr. Rodriguez, and our community. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce you to um, Katrina Hernandez, our campus supervisor. She's here today with her husband, Ramita, and her sister, Maricela, and a few members of Pajaro Middle School. Can you guys wave? <laughs> uh, it's an honor to present uh, Katrina. Um, she does go beyond her job description Katrina has been at Bajaro Middle School for 21 years and is truly her home. She knows the school inside out and I know when Victor comes over, he'll come and ask Katrina where things are sometimes because she knows everything around the school. She really cares about um, the school um, environment and organizes, it's very involved in organizing events and fundraising and giving a lot of her time to make sure that the kids um, succeed in school, have fun at school as well. And um, she's also involved on the fundraising for the kids going to Washington. She has a lot of energy, is very proactive, and um, we are really grateful that she's here at Pajaro Middle School. So it's an honor to present her tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. You know what, Victoria, I just wanted to add that, you know, I've seen her for my whole 15 years. I, I actually know her now from all the time that I've been around. And she's, she's at every event. I mean, she's at your graduation helping people get, you know, sit down and everything. She's, she's um, when there's any event happening at Pottle Middle School, she's there helping the cars get, you know, parked. Oh, I don't know. She's always there. She's at every, she's um, helping you with, if you go, you know, if you're going to an event and she's at the front and having you write your name. I mean, she's like, I mean, I'm just, I actually know, actually from all these years, I have to say this about her. She's like, wow, I'm so glad that you're finally the one you should have been, you should have gotten this, you know, years ago, really, to be honest with you. I mean, you should have gotten this more than once maybe, but I think she's like the greatest and having her um, as part of Pottle Middle School has been so great, and I'm so glad to know you, too. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Right. Item 4.1. I am looking for a motion to approve the agenda. Can we get a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. Okay. Item uh, 
I'm looking for a motion to approve the minutes from our May 9th, 2018 meeting. A second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Motion carries. And I was um, just told that we don't have um, high school representatives uh, for tonight's reports. So we're going to skip that item and go straight to item 7.1 for public comment. So before I begin um, um, this item, I just want to remind folks that there would be, um, there's a limit uh, to the number of minutes per speaker. So for this particular item, since there's only one, um, it would be three minutes. Okay, so I'm going to call up the person. So it's Becky Steinbrenner. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Becky Steinbrenner. I came to your last board meeting and talked with you about the cliff swallow nesting issue at Pajaro Valley High School. And I want to um, tell you that I met today with Mr. Joe Dominguez, and it was one of the best meetings I've ever had because he recognizes that we can do better uh, with this issue of the cliff swallow nesting and protect at the same time the health and safety of the students. So I want to really thank him for his willingness to work with the community, the biologists, on behalf of the students and the birds and the facilities. And I think it's going to work out really well. I really want to um, thank you, Mr. Dominguez, for your cooperative spirit, your very genuine personal interest in this rich, very rich opportunity for learning with the students and the staff and the community. And um, to really make a difference in a positive way that is going to put forth lessons for the students in a much more positive way than what has been happening. Um, I must tell you that while I was waiting for Mr. Dominguez to arrive, uh, more than one staff member came up to me. They had my name tag, and it had something about cliff swallow sightings. Many of them are very depressed by the actions the district has taken to spend $55,000 to put up Lexan to exclude the cliff swallows from trying to build their nest, to raise their young, and to wash them down repeatedly. It's been very depressing to many of the people that work there. And so I am so happy that that's going to change, that, that, that it can change. and. Um, I'm sure that this will be a much better outcome for everybody in the community and the environment as well. So thank you, Mr. Dominguez. You're, you're a great addition. That. He's only been here a month, and he's a real, real asset. And I'm really um, honored to have met you and to know you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We, should, we should all clap. clap. <laughs> Okay, um, item 8.0, employee organization comments, 8.1, PVFT. Thank you, Francisco Rodriguez with the Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers. Um, uh, first of all, I just wanted to um, uh, point out that we, uh, or as, as you know, we have a, a tentative agreement. Um, it is, uh, a, a compromise that we have uh, reached. Um, it, it provides uh, a, a race uh, for our teachers, um, and it also allows us to um, sit back and look at uh, where you will end up financially. And in September, as you know, you will receive the unaudited actuals, and uh, we will be able to determine whether there will be a break in the eight-year history um, that we have been tracking. Um, and hopefully, we will be able to uh, stand here in September and uh, congratulate uh, the district in having uh, you know, more or less correct projections. Um, 
we hope that um, we are able to establish a relationship with uh, the new uh, finance department uh, headed under Mr. Dominguez, and that uh, if, if we all know the facts, if we all know uh, and trust that uh, we all are aware of the facts, then it's easier to come to an agreement. And uh, we hope that moving forward, um, that's the case. Uh, we are still not quite at our goal, which is to have every fully prepared teacher, uh, that's step one, column four, um, start at a minimum of $50,000 uh, annual salary. And uh, we hope that uh, we are able to work with you uh, to achieve that goal. I think it will be uh, something that will benefit both students, uh, staff, and the community as a whole. Um, I also wanted to um, ask your approval of the staff's recommendation uh, for denial of Watsonville uh, Prep School. Uh, I believe that the uh, page, the 16 page uh, report that is in your packet is quite accurate. I think the uh, staff uh, did a very good job in analyzing and looking at um, the petition, and uh, we, you know, we uh, we ask for your support of the staff, um, of your staff, uh, to and uh, deny uh, the petition. Um, thirdly, I would like to invite you to. Uh, this Friday at 4 o'clock at El Altenos, there will be um, uh, an event uh, for uh, a Meet the Candidate event. Um, meet Robert R uh, Rivas for uh, AD30. Um, and we'll have a guest speaker, Dolores Huerta, uh, attending. Um, I just want to point out, uh, Mr. Rivas has uh, uh, refused any contributions or support from the California Charter Schools at, um, Association, uh, we believe, and he has uh, a record, proven record of fighting for uh, community interests, including uh, support for uh, Measure J, which, J uh, which banned fracking in San Benito County, Measure Z, uh, which kind of did the same in uh, Monterey County, and um, he is currently a, a teacher, and as you know, Dolores Huerta herself is a teacher. So we invite you all to come and uh, help us uh, support him and uh, support public education and uh, keep uh, nonprofits and for-profit organizations that want to skim off the money that is meant to educate English language learners, foster kids, and kids who qualify for uh, free and reduced meals away from um, uh, or, or giving them the opportunity to take those monies. So again, uh, you're invited and I hope to see you there. Thanks. Thank you. Do we have someone from CSEA? No? Um, Pabam? about CWA. Okay, so moving to action items. Um, our first item tonight's 9.1, PVZ consideration of the Watsonville Prep School Charter Petition. And the report will be given by our um, superintendent, Dr. Michelle Rodriguez. Yes. Okay, so I tried to identify a way in which I could do some, I could go over the 16 page report um, succinctly. So what you will find is on the screen is the report with the highlights and you also should have a copy of the report with the highlights. So if you do not have that, please raise your hand and Eva will provide it to you. And I'm going to, this isn't going to work for me you're going to have to you're going to have to do it okay so what we're going to do is we are i'm going to read just the highlighted portions and highlight the key portions of it so you can go down to the first highlight 
Um, so what you will see is one thing that I wanted to note was that in the petition itself, it spoke to the fact that they would not offer transitional kindergarten unless we required them to do so. This is a significant concern to me because as you are aware, most of our students come in not having read a book, um, had a pencil in their hand, and taking away the opportunity to have another year of instruction is a concern um, I just wanted to note. Um, there are three specific areas in which I'm going to talk to tonight um, where we found um, deficiencies in the charter in both their proposed educational program, deficiencies in the plan for educating specifically English language learners, um, students with special needs, migrant students, and foster students, and then also I'll speak to specific omissions in their operating budget and the financial projections. So as you will see, there is a list of 11 of us of the team staff and members of le um, legal counsel. So you'll see uh, myself and then also um, 10 other um, directors and um, mostly directors or, or cabinet members were involved in looking at the different components. And we did as well have legal review from DWK as well. So. Um, just to set forth, um, there are standards for review of the petition. The board is only, and school district, is only allowed to deny a, a petition for a charter school on based on written factual findings and also things specific um, to support those findings. And there are six specific areas in which the, a charter can be denied. No other ways can a charter be denied. So if we continue to scroll down, you'll see that we are, um, the staff recommendation is denial. Legally, we do, there are three options. One is to approve the petition. The other is to approve the petition subject to conditions. And the third is to deny. Um, based on multiple factors, the recommendation is to deny, and it's based on these four areas that we believe that, and we'll go over the specifics of each one in a minute, but we believe they are unlikely to successfully implement the program based on the petition. And remember, it's based on the four corners of the petition, not anything else. Um, the petition does not contain the required numbers of signatures. It fails to provide a reasonably comprehensive description of everything that's required, of the required elements. And we believe that it's an unsound educational program for the pupils to be enrolled in the charter school. So specifically, um, what, what I want to mention is now the first finding. So the first finding was that they're unlikely to implement the program described in the petition. And so here are the factual findings leading to that. The first one is probably the most cut and dry in that it is non-subjective. And we believe that they have an unrealistic financial and operational plan for it. One is in return in form of the donation review. Um, our do don donation revenue. And so they, in their appendix, um, they put that they would receive a $150,000 donation um, for year zero. And we do not, um, they do not indicate where that donation would come from. They do indicate a revolving loan of $250,000 um, that would be paid in equal amounts over a five-year period, but the repayment is omitted from their budget. For the startup costs, they do not state that there are any um, PCS G GP or any other implementation grants, and it's also silent on how they would address startup costs. Um, continuing on in textbooks, um, as you know, we have um, textbooks are very costly. For year one, they have that they would only have a budget of $3,500 um, for year one, all the way up to $9,000 in year five. And we believe that is well, it's completely inadequate in order to be able to su um, support the instruction of hundreds of students. For facilities rent, the budget does not include any expense of any amount or the rental for facilities, and the budget fails to account for costs associated with housing, um, Watsonville. Um, 
public charter schools. Um, transportation, this is a serious concern for myself because we have, um, of our 20,400 students, approximately 17% of our regular education students utilize district funded and operated home to school transportation each day on 32 different routes. Apart from that special education population, we have 12% of our students, so 350 students who also use that on an additional 25 routes. And so this petition, in our view, fails to acknowledge um, our community's heavy reliance on district provided transportation services and access to schools and related programs. And the budget fails to account for any expenses related to busing or transportation services for the respective students. For special education, it would be required. For professional development, there's multiple references to coaching. However, the budget reflects an annual expenditures for professional development only of 24,500 in year one, all the way up to 54,000 in year five. And we believe that this amount, um, it isn't, we're unable to determine if this is amount is su sufficient to be able to train, coach, and develop their teachers. For their district fiscal oversight, um, they do slate the 3%. Um, don't go to the next page quite yet. Um, it, they actually incorrectly slated that, but before we go to the next page where I give you details, I do want to read the footnote that is down below because this is important. One thing that they put in their petition on page 132 of their petition is that they would operate within the Watsonville city limits. The charter school must provide, um, must provide a preference to students who reside within our boundaries of the school district um, in which it operates. And as you know, because we have several trustees that are outside of the, um, Watsonville boundaries, is that we operate in, in areas outside of the city of Watsonville. And therefore, their target population of students within the city of Watsonville is inconsistent with our, our attendance boundaries and serves to exclude exclude students who do not reside within Watsonville. So going to the next page, in terms of the oversight, actually go down, just go up a little bit, please. There you go. Um, so I just want to mention that shows that they incorrectly, they incorrectly applied the 3% in their budgets. Um, by a shortfall of 28,000. So as CMO um, with the management fees, we believe that it is a, it's a high, um, high management fee totaling 14% of their revenues annu annually. We, in comparison, our management, all management, every single person, both site, district, is at 6%. So they are over, they would be providing over double of what we provide um, in terms of cost um, for management. With special education contract services, there's no, they do have um, a significant expenditure in there, um, but they have no indication in the notes and assumptions regarding what the services would entail. We do have a concern regarding the teacher-student ratio. Um, the budget notes and assumptions suggest that the student-teacher ratio is the 21 to one or 22 to one. But however, if you look at the chart, it actually refers to the number of teachers per grade per year, and it provides that there will only be two teachers per grade. I do want to note, that's why I noted previously the TK issue. If we required it, which we would, that would also impact their budget, which is not within the current budget. Um, when we look at their custodial maintenance and food services, they indicate that they will only employ one FTE to do all of the custodial maintenance and food services, and we feel that that is inadequate to be able to address the critical needs to support implementation. They also have, um, they also miscalculated um, or, or misspoke in their petition in terms of ADA percentage. Um, on two different pages, which we noted which ones, they vacillated between 96% of its enrollment and 95%. In middle school program funding, they also have no indication in the budget of how the petitioners would onboard or implement a full middle school program. Continuing on, 
the petitioner's past history of operating other charter schools is not aligned with our proposed charter school. So we do believe that they're failing to, um, failing to specify current and relevant information <laughs> regarding our specific students um, population of PVUSD. So we feel that they are lacking, taking into consideration long-term English learners, migrant students, foster youth, and transportation demands. And we feel that these omissions um, reflect the lack of understanding of our unique population and the PVUSD community. So when we continue on this, we believe that they, they do not have contained the required number of signatures. They are required to have the specific number of signatures of their teachers. Um, they express that there are seven meaningfully interested teachers. More than half of those seven teachers um, needed in the first year of charter. That's what is in their petition. However, six of those seven teachers that signed the petition are current teachers at two of their other charter schools, including four teachers from Gilroy Prep. And so we, we question whether or not the teachers can work at the other navigator schools, which have a very different population from ours, and still be meaningfully interested in teaching teaching at um, WPS, or how will their displacement from those existing schools impact those schools' community? And so we feel that the signatures do not meet the requirements of the education code. Continuing on, we believe that they do not contain a reasonably comprehensive description of the required elements and fail to adequately describe the plan for specific subgroups of students many which are our grand majority of our students. So long-term English learners, they have no mention of scope and sequence for ELD. They have no ELD included in their assessment plan. In their selection process for the school site members, they have inaccuracies within that process. They also have no mechanism for the ELAC and school, uh, school site council to have an overlap and they incorrectly address um, English learner assessment, state assessments. They labeled it on page 267 as CELT, that is outdated information. LPAC as of this year and next year is the assessment that is used um, in 1819. They also have no curriculum overview for ELD. They have no educational technology listed for ELD and probably well, concerning to me is they specifically state that sites not in English and um, unless required by class are off limits. In terms of migrant students, they only have two references in their entire um, large document, and they fail to recognize the 11% of our students um, that are classified as migrant. They're silent on how they will serve those migrant student family populations. They're also silent as to whether these migrant students will be permitted back as most of the time they miss from five, four to five months of school due to um, the migratory process of their families. They lack any mention of so socioeconomic status of the migrant population, and it does not appear on the face of the petition that any such meeting or consultation was held with migrant PAC or with the migrant pre-K programs. In terms of mathematics, um, we had a significant amount there. We do believe that their methods that they have for teaching um, for um, teaching me uh, methodologies is not aligned with the expectations of Common Core and is obsolete methodology. Um, we also, their whole brain teaching description lacks an explanation of how this applies to mathematics instruction and the mirror strategy prevents students from being innovative mathematicians. Um, in terms of mathematic assessments, the types of mathematic questions that will be included in the assessments are not included, and specifically they lack the information on the depth of knowledge levels um, within their document. So reteaching of the standards is something that we have been focusing on. Um, it's really providing feedback on student thinking and ensuring that students are reflecting on that learning in a metacognitive way. In summation, our staff felt that um, after the sequencing that the students would not be prepared to be successful in the transition to integrated math one. For special education, it does not appear
the, it does not discuss the unique challenges that face the middle school population. Um, continuing on, they do not provide a reasonably comprehensive description of the governance structure of the charter school, including the process to be followed to ensure parent involvement. And actually, th so they have that the petition does not provide specific as to what role, if any, the CUE, uh, the CUE or C CEO, excuse me, CEO and navigator will play at Watsonville Prep, especially given the fact that the CEO presumably oversees multiple schools. And then they speak to the board, their board may delegate the management of the co corporation's activities to any individual's management company or committees, provided that the activities and the affairs of the corporation shall be managed and all corporate power shall be exercised under the ultimate direction of the board. And such broad delegation rights does not ensure consistency and continuity in governance. Um, for conflicts of interest, there also is no assurances in the petition bylaws or conflict of interest policy that the charter school and its board will comply with the provisions of government code section 1090 or common law conflicts of interest. A particular concern is the lack of parent involvement in the governance. We actually feel that the petition is clear that the parents will not be significantly involved. It states specifically in their petition that the, the navigator board shall include representatives and members of the community, including one parent representative from Gilroy Prep School and one parent representative from Hollister Prep School, the foundational schools. And they also state that it will be in a convenient location for both charter schools, assuming that both schools for this purpose presumably refers to Gilroy Prep and Hollister Prep up, therefore excluding Watsonville as a potential location. The petition does not provide a reasonably comprehensive description. Um, AB 1432 Education Code Section 44691 requires charter schools to provide annual training to their employees and persons working on behalf of, of who are mandated reporters, that is not in their petition. And they also did not follow the emergency operations plan, does not meet the standards set by the county grand jury. The charter school must articulate a plan that uses the standard emergency management system, SIMS, and it did not. Continuing on, the petition does not provide a reasonably comprehensive description of legally per permissible emissions policies. And again, we go back to what we had said before, the emissions preference will be given to those living within the city of Watsonville city limits, despite the fact that PVUSD serves students in other areas such as Monterey County and Aptos. This purported emissions preference is illegal in the Education Code section 47605D. And the petition does not provide reasonably comprehensive description of suspension and discipline procedures that the charter school will utilize. It specifically did not address many of the required non-discretionary expendable offenses, and so we noted those down there. They also have no indication of interventions before suspension process begins. Because of all the items found already submitted above, we believe that the petition presents an unsound education program. And in conclusion, the staff is recommending the denial of the petition, adopting this report as written factual findings required to support its denial of the petition as described. Thank you. So before we bring it back to the board for questions or comments, uh, we do have speakers for tonight. There is about 30 speakers, so I will be limiting the time to two minutes. Um, I ask that all speakers try to stick to that. Um, I don't want to be rude, but I will interrupt um, if you exceed those two minutes. I really want to hear from everyone. And so let's be cautious about that to allow everyone to, to share their point of view with us tonight. If a speaker needs uh, translation services, we, I am gonna ask Virginia, our translator, to step up here uh, to translate those statements from English to Spanish if needed. Um, so with that, I'm gonna call up Yuko Pearson, followed, with, followed by Emerenciana Abrego, and Katie Tapis. And I would like to ask the speakers to please line up so that we can move um, the process along. Thank you.
Hello, thank you for allowing me to speak. I honestly didn't think that I would make it here, so I did not prepare anything, I'll be honest, and so I'll speak from the heart. Um, this is my daughter, Piper. She's a sixth grader at Hollister Prep, the, pilots, the pilot class um, at that school, and this is Paige. She's a second grader. Um, I will just say that you will not meet a more passionate group than this group who are very um, focused on the mission of Navigator Schools. Um, my experience with them and their, their teaching, they pivot quickly and they effectively improve classroom learning time. Um, the, the Navigator School, I believe they see the big picture and they're preparing young minds for the world and the real world. It's not going to be quite like that 20 page or whatnot written up um, scripted um, paperwork, it's, it's real life, and I think that they're very um, well prepared for that. Um, in terms of teaching um, the Pajaro, Pajaro Valley Schools, um, I'm going to do something very unorthodox, but this is how we started with Navigator, and I'm hoping you'll all sing along too, but this is what the <laughs> song they started with, and they have since moved on to more uh, sophisticated songs that include math, English, um, from Miss Parsons here. So, ready girls? <coughs> you want to sing along? Okay, ready? We are navigators, yes we are. We are navigators going far. We work hard during the day. So at night we rest and play. Math facts we know. Writing we show. Reading each night. College someday. We are navigators, yes we are. We are navigators going far. Thank you. Buenas noches. Como miembro de esta comunidad, estoy aquí para apoyar la nueva propuesta de tener otra escuela charter aquí en nuestra comunidad. Creo que es una grandiosa oportunidad para nuestros estudiantes. ¿Emerencia? Sí. Um, uh, perdón que le interrumpe. Ahorita vamos a um, traer okay, a Virginia. Oh, so ella, la, ella la va a estar este, traduciendo lo que um, usted está diciendo. Oh, okay. Gracias. So, si puede comenzar de nuevo, por favor. Gracias. Sí. Okay. Dice, como miembro de esta comunidad, estoy aquí para apoyar la nueva propuesta de tener otra escuela charter aquí en nuestra comunidad. Creo que es una grandiosa oportunidad para nuestros estudiantes porque están comprometidos a prepararlos con una excelente educación. Como madre de familia, quiero decir que, los, que las escuelas charter se comprometen a hacer un buen trabajo con nuestros hijos. Yo me siento privilegiada de haber tenido la oportunidad de que prepararan a mis hijos muy bien y lograran ir a la universidad. Por esta razón, quiero que otros estudiantes tengan la misma oportunidad de una buena educación, lo cual les permitirá prepararlos para la universidad. Espero contar con su apoyo para juntos lograr el éxito de nuestros estudiantes. Gracias. As a member of this community, I'm happy to support the new um, proposal to have another charter school in our community, and I believe that it's a grand opportunity for our students um, so that they are committed uh, and, and to be able to prepare them for an excellent education. And as a mother of a family, I want to say that this, the charter schools are, um, I, I promise to do a good job with our children, and I feel a privilege to have had the opportunity uh, that they are that they would be prepared, uh, or that they would prepare my children, and uh, and to be able to go to the university. For this reason, I want uh, I want other students to have the uh, the same opportunity of a good education, the one that is permitted uh, that they are permitted to be prepared. Um, for the university. I hope to be able to count with your support and uh, together we will um, reach um, success for our, our students. Uh, hi, I'm Katie Tapiz and um, I'm a senior at Saba College Prep and I'm going to be attending San Francisco State University this fall. And um, 
Um, as having a young, younger sibling, you want the best for them, and I see a lot of potential in Watson Will Prep. And um, sorry. <laughs> um, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not good at public speaking. It's, um, as long as with my brother, I feel like other kids should learn, like college is something that they should strive for and that it's just not a thought. It should be, like, because <laughs> when I was my brother's age, I wouldn't have thought that I was going to be standing here saying that. I have plans for college, so it's just, yeah. Sorry, I'm really all over this. Sweetheart, you're doing a great job. job. <laughs> yeah, we understand what you're saying. Okay. Thank you for coming up. <laughs> okay, so we have uh, Patrick Walsh, followed by Michelle Tapis and Jennifer Holm. Good evening, trustees and Superintendent Rodriguez. Uh, my name is Patrick Walsh, and I'm with the California Charter Schools Association, uh, and I'm here in support of Watsonville Prep School. The intent of the Charter Schools Act was to expand options and opportunities to families, as well as to foster innovation. The Education Code was clearly written to say that a, a school district shall not deny a petition unless it makes written factual findings that the petition lacks one or more of the six elements that we saw earlier. The, the intent of the legislature and the Ed Code was for districts to approve charters, retaining local control and oversight authority at the level closest to the community, closest to the families and people who live here. While we appreciate the work that Dr. Rodriguez and her team are doing in Pajaro Valley and the close relationship that she clearly has with both district authorized and district dependent charters, we are very concerned that the staff report as it's written seems to be written with the intent to deny this petition. It seems to have been gone through with a fine tooth comb to find every little thing that they possibly could find. I've never seen a charter, a staff report that critiques a charter petition's description of math manipulatives. I've never seen a report that claims that a school model that is excelling with similar student populations, not the exact same, but with similar student populations in neighboring districts labeled or branded as an unsound educational model that is demonstrably unlikely to successfully implement the education program set forth in the petition. They're doing it right up the street. They're happy to have you come visit. They are implementing the model that they want to implement here, but they spent a lot of time on community investment to make sure that the model fits the model here in the community. The staff, uh, as you know, the board adopts these written findings of facts and denies this petition. The petitioners will likely appeal this decision to the county and then potentially onto the State Board of Education. The petition will be re reviewed against the same standards found in that, that we have here tonight, and depending on those findings, could potentially be approved. Uh, in that case, the charter would, require, would be required to locate here, would be required to serve these students, but your board would have no oversight authority. And so we would like to see th this local board retain that local oversight authority and be able to make the decisions about how this charter should be operated Thank at you, the Patrick. level closest to the community. Hello, my name is Michelle Tapiz, and I'm a mom, a parent, and I have four children. Um, I have to say that I have had the extreme just the pleasure educating my kids in Pajaro Valley District. Um, my first three did attend um, Mar Vista Elementary, um, but um, two of my boys um, have autism, and um, I just found that they weren't offering them enough uh, learning tools. Um, and so I sought out another path for them. And I'm curious because there was some information that was read um, by Dr. Michelle Rodriguez about um, 
about how students learn. And I just have to say that each kid learns differently. Each child can learn the information. And it's so important because now I have an, a four-year-old that's about to start kindergarten. And transitional kindergarten may or may not be his path. But that's the idea that I want to set forth is that parents in our community need more options and we want to make choices for our children and how they learn and set forth their path because so far my first child who attended Mar Vista Elementary and Saba College Prep with autism graduated high school top of his class and went to college. I don't think he would have gotten that from a larger school like a larger public school um, like PB High or Watsonville High because that environment is not for him. Um, my daughter who spoke earlier, she's going to college. She did go to um, a charter school, save a college prep as well. So I'm saying that it does work when parents make a choice. It does work, period. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. My name is Jennifer Holm, and I've been a PVUSD parent for the last 15 years with another eight to go. I believe in the power of a strong public school system to enrich communities and form a foundation for a strong democracy. I believe in the power of choice, but the choices before us as parents making decisions for our children must be good ones. My daughter went to Alianza for three years. I have seen firsthand the power a charter school can offer when it is inclusive and accountable to the wider community. I'm not seeing that in this petition. With respect to the trustees, as Dr. Rodriguez alluded to, many of the families in your areas will likely be excluded due to the preference for students within Watsonville city limits. We need inclusive improvements to our schools. Also, the charter management organization fees start at $250,000 and go up to over $630,000 in the last projected year. Top-heavy management spending, 14% of the projected revenue at a time where our district's kids are already impacted by budget constraints, seems unjust and fiscally irresponsible. I question the ethics of benefiting a small number of students to the detriment of those left behind. I urge the board to vote no on the petition. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. So I apologize ahead of time if I mispronounce your names. Okay. Uh, we have Donna Backick. Thank you. Followed by Michelle McCown and Veronica Rubio. Good evening. Uh, district board, Madam Superintendent. I heard a lot today, um, went through that lovely, um, I guess you could say, summary of the district's uh, and the staff's findings. Uh, I'd like to point a few things out myself. Uh, in August of 2017, this district published a statement from Madam Superintendent uh, which made a few promises and highlighted um, some very inspiring and important things. Uh, and I just want to read briefly from that statement because I think it, it bears repeating and reminding. Uh, in the statement, Madam uh, Superintendent states, we will ensure student success through providing high quality learning environments, expanding parent and community partnerships, and maintaining quality staff. We will continue students learning at the center or we will place students learning at the center of all decisions. I repeat, we will continue to place students learning at the center of all decisions. In a statement uh, published shortly after that by Eva Renteria, uh, there's another very important point I'd like to point out. The district staff and board of trustees work with parents and the community parents in the community to mobilize all possible resources to ensure quality learning and safe and clean schools for our students. 
I've actually been a member of the Navigator School's family for four years. And this isn't the first time I've spoken on their behalf, and it's easy to do so. The success is proven time and time again, first with Gilroy Charter, then with Hollister Charter. They are succeeding. They are succeeding. But I don't need to spout the numbers. You have plenty of very eloquent speakers who have numbers for you to consider. I will leave you with a couple of things. Uh, you published a community presentation March 2018 that it tells your parent community that you need more growth in the area of core subjects. And there was an article published in the Santa Cruz Sentinel on January 22nd of 2018 that actually explains the deficiency in this district as to two subcategories, your English learners and your Hispanic students who are testing in the lowest performance category on state tests. And in this article, I'm going to leave you with one thing. It's a quote by Kern County. Donna, can you wrap it up, please? Yes, I can. Kern County Office of Education employee Lisa Gilbert, when discussing what happens when the state has to come in and help districts with these deficiencies. And she says, it requires looking in the mirror, not out the window and being honest about what you're doing and what you're not doing to help the kids. I urge you to seriously consider the successful program implemented by Navigator Schools for your Thank community. You. Good evening, uh, Superintendent and board members as well as the community. My name is Michelle McCown, and I'm a teacher with the Hollister School District. I'm speaking tonight uh, because like you, I want to see uh, students in our schools succeed. And I've seen firsthand the powerful impact that Navigator Schools has had on students' academic success. I was first introduced to James Dent uh, early in 2013 as he was setting to open up the second campus for Navigator Schools in Hollister. Over the past five years, I have observed not only the dedication that he and his staff have for improving the performance of students in groups that often underperform, but the genuine kindness and positive relationship building that they have extended to the community with um, encompassing the students, parents, and various stakeholders. They also continued this community building by working with Hollister School District staff. Mr. Dent promoted collaboration right from the beginning by inviting Hollister School District teachers to a professional development on whole brain teaching that Hollister Prep School was hosting. The relationship between Navigator Schools and Hollister School District teachers has been very beneficial and continues to strengthen as we share resources and professional learning. As an example, the teachers and instructional aides from Hollister St School District, specifically R.O. Hardin Elementary, were able to attend a two-week training before the start of the 2016-17 school year. The training focused on strategies to maximize student engagement and best practices. Navigator Schools has continued to develop their educators as well as the student learning through their use of high expectations, rigorous instructional delivery, best practices, and innovative lesson design to promote and ensure positive educational outcomes and school of choice. Thank you, Michelle. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, so we have Janelle Ruley, followed by Lisa Oxello and Chris Lincar. Hola, buenas tardes. Good evening. Uh, mi nombre es Veronica Rubio. I am Veronica Rubio. Um, estoy aquí para apoyar a la escuela, a los compañeros para la escuela charter. I'm here to support the um, people from the charter school. Um, estoy interesada, verdad, en la, en el, en la escuela. Soy una madre con cuatro hijas. I'm interested in the school and I'm a mother of four children. Uh, tengo dos hijas um, en la CEPA, en la high school. I have two daughters at the high school. 
a una una ya se va a recibir de um, va a graduarse. graduarse. De, one of them is going to graduate de high school yeah. from high school. Um, va a la universidad de, va a ir a la universidad. And then she's going to go to the university. Um, y tengo dos hijas pequeñas que me gustaría que, que fueran a and I have two small daughters that I would like to have them go to that school. And that's why I'm here today. To have a better education. And I'm sorry for not being very prepared. Thank you, and that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, board members and Superintendent Rodriguez. My name is Janelle Ruley. I'm an attorney with the Law Offices of Young, Mini, and Core. We represent more than half of the charter schools in this state. Um, I'm here tonight on behalf of Watsonville Prep and, and do strongly urge you to approve this charter petition. In reviewing the district staff's findings, we were actually really disappointed by how many findings were legally or factually inaccurate or simply went beyond any reasonable expectation for a charter petition. Regarding petition signatures, for example, the staff findings inexplicably and unlawfully substitute the district's judgment for whether a particular adult could choose to, to be meaningfully interested in teaching at Watsonville Prep substituting their own judgment instead of the judgment of that particular individual who knows whether or not he or she is meaningfully interested in teaching there. There are no laws or regulations that define meaningful interest when it come to, comes to signatures. In, that, in the absence of any direction, we have to side with the individuals who sign a piece of paper saying that they are meaningfully interested, who made their own personal decisions. All of the people who signed are qualified to teach at Watsonville Prep. All of the people who signed are able to teach at Watsonville Prep. And what their choice means for other navigator schools is not a concern of the district, and it's not a lawful consideration for denial of this charter petition. Quite simply, district staff have no authority and no basis for making this claim. When it comes to the admissions preferences, this too was inexplicable. There is a preference in the charter for residents of the district. That's what the law says. The law says we have to have a preference for residents of the district, and we do. It's in there. It's, it's there. Uh, the law also specifically asks us to identify the target student population. In some cities, the target student population is identified by a zip code or a couple of zip codes or maybe a neighborhood. In this case, the target student population is the city of Watsonville. There is also an admission preference for all residents of the district. We have to do that, and we have done that. That's already there in the charter. There is also a finding about Government Code Section 1090, which does not apply to charter schools. Thank you for your time. I, I know mine's up. Thank you. Hello, my name is Lisa Ucello, and I am currently a literacy coach in the Hollister School District. Um, I, like many of you tonight, wondered why should we allow a school to come into our community and steal our students and our resources? At the time, back in 2012, Gilroy Prep School was already operating. I decided to visit the site to see what was so special about this charter school. As an educator for 15 years, I didn't think I would see anything I hadn't seen before. However, after my visit, I knew I had taken a drink of educational Kool-Aid. I wanted more. With the help of Navigator, my colleagues and I implemented many of Navigator's instructional practices. With no district support, and limited resource and resources and technology, our students knocked it out of the park. Six years later, I'm a literacy coach at a Hollister school that shares a campus with Hollister Prep School. At the beginning of the year, our entire staff was trained in navigator strategies and best teaching practices. I often reach out to Hollister Prep staff for resources and advice. We are always welcome in classrooms, and I'm always welcome to take teachers in to observe best practices. So when you vote tonight, I urge you to vote yes, and you'll be happy that you did. Good evening, I'm Kirsten Carr. 
As a proud employee of Navigator Schools, I was both surprised and disappointed by several of the points in the staff findings. Key among them, however, was the unfounded claim we are unlikely to implement the program des described in the petition by referencing a section of the Ed Code that does not apply to Navigator. Not only have we never had a charter revoked or school closed, we have instead been unanimously approved for five-year renewals from both authorizing districts, have received recognition from Innovate Public Schools, Silicon Schools, the Christensen Institute, and we even garnered a visit from Dr. Michael Kirst, the current president of the State Board of Education. And while the recognitions are nice to have, especially in situations like this, what contradicts the PVUSD staff claim even more are the numerous requests we get weekly to two or navigator campuses. These requests come from educators near and far who have heard about our commitment to collaborating, about our interest in improving the educational system for all students, and about our success in closing the achievement gap. Just as we go out and learn from top performing schools, we now open our doors to enable anyone and everyone to take whatever knowledge they need to help them. This is the behavior of a top performing charter and one who truly wants to become a part of PVUSD. We urge you to vote yes tonight. Thank you. We have Caitlin Bride followed by Debbie Benitez and Heather Parsons. Good evening to the board members and Superintendent Rodriguez. My name is Katrin Wright. I work at the Silicon Schools Fund. We're a foundation that provides grants and non-financial support to district schools, charter schools, and independent schools across Northern California. I'm also the Navigator Schools Board Chair. We at Silicon Schools work with over 40 schools who are in the top quartile of performance academically. And even given this high bar, the two Navigator schools that we've made grants to are the top performing schools academically in our portfolio and are certainly the most invested in being incredible partners to the districts that they work with. We've given Navigator schools $1 million, over $1 million to date. Our board has made a commitment of $800,000 just to Watsonville Prep, including a signed grant agreement for $200,000 to Watsonville Prep that will be received to support year zero activities. But taking a step back, board members, I know you're here because you strive to serve the students of Watsonville to the best of your abilities. And I know charter being put in front of you is tricky for the adults. I've worked at Silicon Schools for six years. This is the first time I have come to testify on any charter's behalf. And I do that because I urge you to consider that if there is one time that you will vote to approve a charter, it should be this one. I have to say, they will do exceptional things for the students of Watsonville. I've seen it since 2012, been in the classrooms multiple times every year. They will be exceptional partners to you. Frankly, no matter what you do here, they will strive to be exceptional partners to you at the district. Sometimes the hard thing to do is the right thing to do. Sometimes the hard thing to do is having the courage to do what's right for the Watsonville students that you were elected to serve. I hope to see that courage in action tonight in approving the Watsonville prep petition. Thank you for your time. Good evening. As the former academic dean at Gilroy Prep School, the current vice, vice principal at Hollister Prep School, and next year's principal of HPS, I take our commitment to providing a solid ELD program very seriously. Therefore, I was a bit surprised when the findings regarding our ELD program were referring to a paragraph of our parent handbook and not our ELD program itself. As the charter stipulates, the Navigator educational model was designed to accelerate English language development. The constant integration of ELD strategies across the instructional program and in all subject areas has led to the Navigator English learner populations excelling on the SBAC 
far outperforming their subgroup averages across the state. Our integrated and designated ELD programs are designed to build academic English language proficiency in tandem with mastering the content standards adopted by the California State Board of Education. The daily schedule included in the charter illustrates the time and commitment dedicated to the success of our EL students. Navigator's mission directly addresses the needs of underserved students, and as I hope you have seen by now, each one of us is deeply connected to that mission. That mission-driven approach translates to the services needed for all students to succeed. And with your support, you will see how that dedication can posit positively impact the students of Watsonville. I urge you to vote yes. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Heather Parsons. I'm a tech junkie and a book lover, so my opinion is balanced as it could possibly be. However, when it comes to staff's finding that our budget for textbooks was woefully inadequate, the techie side of me was definitely offended. To keep up with the times and with the educational pedagogy that places a premium on integrating the tools of the future into today's classrooms, Navigator and WPS will continue to invest heavily in the future of education. The Navigator School model includes one-to-one -one student iPads that give all of our students access to online Common Core, Next Generation Science, and California History content. Richard Collada, U.S. Education Advisor to Barack Obama said, textbooks are outdated. They are in a format that is not adaptable. And for students learning another language, they cannot press a word and get a definition. If I'm struggling to see, I can't zoom in. They are not accessible. Our allocation of curriculum funds aligns to our proven educational approach. We look forward to implementing this 21st century approach at Watsonville Prep School. Thank you. So next we have Allison Stoll, followed by Marcela Salas Ibarras, followed by Missy Corral. Good evening. My name is Allison Stoll. As a small group instructor, also known as an SGI, at Hollister Prep School, I admit to having a bit of a problem understanding the need to completely ignore the SGIs when discussing the instructor to student ratio at Navigator Schools. We attend the same professional developments, work closely with our grade level partners, receive weekly coaching, and participate in lesson planning. We are as committed to our students as anyone on campus. We may not be certificated teachers, but there are SGIs who hold bachelor's degrees, are C-bested, and are currently pursuing higher education. Just like our students, we are living, breathing examples of mission driven. However, as the potential authorizer of WPS, I understand the need for clarity and do want to make sure you have the full picture of ratio at our schools. In the first year, WPS will employ eight certificated teachers, including six classroom teachers and two teachers in trainings, also known as TNTs, resulting in a ratio of 22 and a half students per certificated teacher. With the, education, with the addition of more TNTs in future years, the ratio continues to drop. Additionally, in year one, there will be one full-time certificated RSP teacher, four small group instructors like me, maybe even myself, and two RSP per paraprofessionals, resulting in a ratio of 13 students to one member of the instructional team. We make a difference. And you will see that difference could mean to students in Watsonville if you would just give us a chance. Thank you. Hello, my name is Marcela. And I'm a parent. Um, we deserve more options for our kids' education, non-overcrowded classrooms and schools. I can't say that enough. 
Our kids deserve the right amount of attention for their education. They need to be able to raise their hand and have a teacher properly answer their questions and actually take the time with them without worry they're holding the class back. I think it's easier for a teacher to spot a problem with a student in a smaller class because it's easier to get to know them very well and understand how each child learns better. Watsonville needs something new. And yeah, when it comes to our kids, no one wants to make a mistake in any way, shape, or form. But we parents are willing to take a chance in a school like this. We need a change now, not years from now. We want our kids to succeed in school and life. We don't want our kids to set up for low paying jobs because their education only allowed them to. We want our kids to think of college universities, becoming lawyers, scientists, specialists in different fields. We believe a school like this can make this happen. These schools are showing results in the kids' education, grades, and behavior, which shows that their methods work and should be further looked into and praised. Don't think of yourselves or money when it comes to our kids' education. Yeah, money is important, and sometimes there isn't enough to go around. But it also is very important the type of education they get and how it will affect their lives and their futures. And if we can give them the best, then why not offer and give them the best? Thank you. Yeah. Hello, my name is Missy Corral, and while I'm not here to talk tonight to you as a signatory on a petition, I do want you to know I'm interested in being a part of this incredible opportunity to impact students on Watsonville. Currently, I am serving as an Innovation Fellow for Navigator Schools, but the bulk of my experience at GPS or Gilroy Prep has been as a STEM teacher, math and science, and I can assure you that our math curriculum is more than sound. Our students are excelling in mathematics after years of instruction focused on ensuring our un an understanding of math, developing reasoning and building mathematical communication, and developing habits of mind where they use math and think mathematically. Our results continue to show this approach is having the desired outcome. We shared a video with each of you which demonstrates the why and how much better than I can stand before you here. However, since staff highlighted this as an area of need, I wanted to share the combination of strategies, modeling, and instructional approaches we use that are working. Our math scores have con continued to improve and, as was shared with you a few weeks ago, have resulted in GPS being honored as the top school in mathematics by Innovate Public Schools. Please support our petition for WPS and you can see firsthand the positive impact we can have on a student's mathematical abilities. Thank you. Next up, we have Amy Ortiz, followed by Norma Molchan and James Dent. Hello, I am Amy Ortiz. As Director of Business and Finance for Navigator Schools, I am happy to be here tonight to refute some of the erroneous findings presented in the staff report. Due to time constraints, I will just speak to a few. First, according to Ed Code, the 3% oversight fee the authorize, authorizing district would receive is calculated using LCFF revenue only. One of the findings in the report was that we miscalculated the 3% oversight fee. The fact is that this finding mistakenly used the total revenue to calculate the 3% instead of only the LCFF revenue. The budget projection we submitted is in fact correct. Next, there was a question as to what the CMO fees cover and if they are an appropriate use of public funds. The CMO fee is an appropriate, ethical, and necessary expenditure of public funds as prescribed by the highest standards of the law. Navigator CMO budget is aligned to the broad scope and scale of services it provides to students and staff and provides an array of essential management, support, and operational services. Just to list a few, compliance reporting, business and financial services, human resources, curriculum and professional development, community outreach, and many more and not enough time tonight to list them all. There was also a claim in the report that the budget omitted repayment of the revolving loan, which caused the expenses to be understated. Charter schools use an accrual basis in accounting, rather than a modified accrual, which is what the district uses. Therefore, the budget would neither show the revenue nor the expense from the loan in the fund balances. Those are, those are listed in the year-by-year -year cash flow projections as they should be. We are here to, open, to be open and transparent with you, and I personally look forward to working with your business office, as I do with Gilroy and Hollister, when we become part of the PVUSD community. 
And since my buzzer hasn't go off yet, I am going to speak now as just a proud parent of a first grader at HPS. Oh, one second. So he went in, he came from a public school, went into first grade and was reading at below a first grade level. Uh, we have three weeks of school left and he is now reading at a 2.7 grade level. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Norma Mulchan and I'm a middle school teacher at Gilroy Prep School. I'm also one of the signatories as a meaningfully interested teacher for Watsonville Prep School. I signed that document because I would love to bring Navigator to a new community because a few years ago someone brought Navigator to me. I was a special day class teacher in Hollister School District looking for help in implementing the Common Core. I became a better teacher through the help of one particular group of teachers who I later discovered were a pilot team implementing Navigator ideas. In those classrooms, they were carefully tracking the learning of every single child. And they were using that data to drive what to do next, how to do it, and which students to involve. The result were some of the highest test scores in the district. Now I'm working in Gilroy Prep and I'm learning about the many factors that go into that kind of student achievement. One of my favorite discoveries is that Navigator gets most of our ideas straight out of the classrooms of great teachers. We visit successful schools and great teachers in order to see what they're doing and how we can use those ideas to help our students. Then we regularly host school tours of educators through our classrooms. They learn from us and we learn from their comments and questions. It's a beautiful cycle of learning, teachers from teachers, but the ultimate winner, the kids. I encourage you to vote yes and to continue to learn with us. Good evening, Board of Trustees. I'm James Dent, the Chief Academic Officer for Navigator Schools. Tonight's decision is about children, plain and simple. Your t decision tonight has the potential to completely change the life trajectories of eventually thousands of students, both at Watsonville Prep and PVUSD students. Over the past two weeks, you have heard from Gilroy and Hollister School District teachers, principals, and superintendents that Navigator is all about student success. They reached out to you and shared why they know that a yes vote will be good for the Watsonville community. When we initially petitioned Gilroy and Hollister school districts, we sat down and met with the staffs to clarify any questions they had. We succeeded in developing MOUs that cleared up those questions, and because of the openness, incredible relationships have endured and continue to grow in our authorizing districts. Unfortunately, Dr. Rodriguez chose not to engage with our staff to ach achieve a process of true due diligence. The district had 60 days to review our petition we had two and a half days to respond, which we have. We patiently waited for a response that Dr. Rodriguez promised myself, our director of HR and four of our parents when we met, to have a timely opportunity to respond. It never happened. The good news is that we're exceedingly forgiving, so I forgive that, and still really truly want to work with the district. Over the past two years, six of your PVUSD principals, several support staff, and many PVUSD teachers have visited Gilroy Prep. There's a clearly an interest in our success and a desire to learn and work together. In the past months, Dr. Flores and Dr. Andrew and their boards in Gilroy Unified and Hollister School District unanimously found our petitions to be legally sound. I wasn't surprised you received a recommendation of denial. That's a given based on fear. I believe it's fear of change, the unknown, and the fear of competition. But don't, you don't have to succumb to any of those fears. You're elected officials in a privileged position to lead. Any change starts at the leadership level, and at times you make difficult decisions. It's your responsibility to the children to make decisions that keep them at the forefront. I implore you to work with us, and together we'll all be greater. Thank you. We have Kevin Sped, followed by Andrea Hernandez and Sharon Waller. 
Good evening, trustees, superintendent. I'm Kevin Sved. I have the honor and privilege of serving as CEO for this amazing organization. You could understand how honored and humbled I am to be working with such a talented and dedicated group of professionals and parents who are so dedicated to their children. Now, I understand the business of school districts. I used to be on the other side, not, not up there, but up here presenting on behalf of the district uh, back in Ravenswood City School District in East Palo Alto. And I understand the complexities and I understand why the superintendent would make a recommendation of denial for a charter school, especially or even such a great charter as this one. Um, there's business realities and, and we know those, those factor in. Um, so I, I can understand that. Um, and while I don't agree with the findings, and I hope everyone has received our full, um, our full packet on the response. Uh, we had it distributed earlier. I have more if you didn't. Um, we d definitely don't agree with the findings, and you see our full response there. Um, I remain optimistic about our ability to open Watsonville Prep here in Watsonville. Um, whether we are approved here, which is what our hope is, or at the county, regardless, my hope is that we partner and collaborate with PVUSD, that we learn from each other, that we share best practices, and so that the students, all students, can ultimately be the winners. I spoke to one of our parents who was very saddened by the report, and I was trying to explain how this is just part of the business side of things. It was really hard for her to understand that. She's visited Hollister Prep. She knows in her heart that's the kind of school she wants for her kids. She knows in her heart that's the kind of school she wants for Watsonville. All you have to do is walk into the classroom and feel the love of learning, the joyful struggle, the joyful struggle. students collaborating with each other. She can't accept this report as just part of the process. So I urge you to please support parents like her who want another new option for her children in Watsonville. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Good evening. I am Andrea Hernandez, and I've stood before you three times now, and I hope you can feel my strong desire to be a part of this community as the founding principal of Watsonville Prep School. As a founding teacher at Hollister Prep, I can attest to our ability to both replicate and personalize our educational model to reflect and serve the needs of our community. When HPS first opened, our demographics were very similar to many students of Watsonville. We implemented the model with an extended day option, providing extra intervention and modified as necessary to ensure all students were successful. As you saw in the charter, it worked clearly. It is surprising to me that you do not find that this model can be replicated, given its success in multiple locations. Our students are outperforming their non -E their, their non EL, non socioeconomically disadvantaged counterparts across California, and we will do that here in Watsonville. While I know there's more to life than test scores, that is tangible proof we can share with you right now. We've shared videos and have talked at length about our model, but until you see it firsthand in a school in Watsonville, I hope you will take the results as proof we can make a difference here in PVUSD. Thank you. Good evening, Board, Trust, Board of Trustees and Dr. Rodriguez. I'm Sharon Waller, Director of Student Services and one of the founders of Navigator Schools. And I am mostly a proud third generation Watsonville High School graduate. Um, my, I graduated in class of 79, as I stated last time, my parents in 1956 and my grandparents in 1934. I have fond memories of my math teacher, Mrs. Pogue, and Mr. Padilla, and most especially a deep appreciation for um, a teacher called Mr. Goykovich, my ninth grade English teacher, who taught me to have uh, courage and how important acts of courage were for the human race. And um, as, I, as an aside, I always thought that Willie the Wildcat was named for Mr. Yohiro. Is that true? <laughs> 
You were there when I was there. <laughs> we thought that. Um, I knew I wanted to be a special education teacher um, early. So in seventh grade I, at EA Hall, I was allowed to tutor students in reading. And I found a deep love for special education. So I became a special education teacher. Three of the six founders of Navigator Schools were special educators. So in terms of um, the findings, um, I was uh, quite disappointed. Um, we did do detailed responses back to you. Um, we are a, our own LEA and we take that responsibility extremely seriously. Um, we are part of El Dorado County Charter SELPA we um, follow all of the procedural guidelines that we have to, and we are absolutely prepared to serve the range of students, provide them with the continuum of services. Um, that's our mission. That's one of the reasons we were founded. The last thing we wanna do is to tell a student because of a disability they can't come to our school. We will find a way. We have extraordinary programs. We provide lots of support for our students. So I hope you will allow us to partner with you uh, we want to bring our great school and our inclusion model to this district. And I know that I'm thinking that's in your dreams, too, to have more inclusive education here. And we'd love to be part of that. So thank you. Okay, so we have Timothy, uh, Timothy Pearson, Crystal Toriomi, and Cristina Zamora. Good evening. Um, I'm Timothy Pearson, and I'm a proud parent of two, two girls who are currently enrolled at HPS. And I had originally prepared three or four pages worth of talk about accelerated learning and SBAC scores. But I think the proof that Navigator has brought speaks for itself. So I'd like to just talk as a parent and what I feel as a parent I've noticed a big difference with my kids being members at, at Navigator. A um, little backstory: we moved to Hollister f uh, four years ago from the Bay Area. Um, Piper, who I think you met earlier, uh, had her first three years of school at a private school. So when we moved down to Hollister, we had to figure out what are we going to do, public, private. And fortunately, some friends of ours had told us about the Navigator's public schools and told us about the Gilroy Prep School and that they were gonna be opening one up in Hollister. And being a kid of a elementary school teacher for over 30 years, you know, I, I've seen the, the good and the bad, and I was willing, I, I wanted for my kids to have a, a different opportunity than I had going to school. And I can't tell you enough how happy we are that we made the decision to try to get in the lottery, and we're, we're accepted to Hollister Prep School. Um, <clears throat> my wife, I think she spoke first. She's the president of the PTO. And the parent involvement at HPS is second to none. Um, we do a lot of fundraising. We've had a lot of um, basically bridging gaps in the community, bringing um, the different demographics of the community together. Parents are involved. We do fundraisers. Uh, last Saturday night was the mother-son dance. We had a father-daughter dance last year. And I encourage you to say yes, just because you can give the kids a great, proven, successful opportunity to excel, just like my kids have. Thanks. Thank you. Good evening, board, Dr. Rodriguez. My name is Crystal O'Rourke Toriumi, and I have the honor of speaking to you tonight. To you
quality professional development. Coaching is included as one of our five compass points because we truly believe it is the most effective form of developing our talent and it is the most important activity any site leader performs. When I worked for a traditional school district, I was observed two times a year. The moment I came to Navigator, I knew I'd found something different. We weekly coaching included immediate feedback and then adjustments on classroom management and instructional strategies. And as a result, I developed tenfold as an educator and now as a site leader, I can share my experience of teacher development through instructional coaching. I urge you to vote your conscience and embrace a growth mindset. Say yes to WPS. Do we have Cristina Zamora? No? Um, so with that, I'll bring it back to the board for comments and questions. Karen? I mean, it was really surprising to hear that you pay 14% for management, we pay 6%. We have a school district of 25, you know, 100 students. 20, and what? 20,000. 20,000, that's what I'm saying. 20,500 students. And um, your school is going to have, I don't know, 100, a couple hundred. Um, and so I'm just wondering, you, when you put this list of management employees in here, I'm wondering they must make a ton of money. I mean, 6% here in a school with 20,500 students and you have a school with 200, you're paying 14% in terms of management funds. Woo, incredible. Um, and, I, you know, the lawyer that said that, you know, that was totally wrong that our signatures, you know, would say what they said. And, you know, for me, it's pr pretty surprising why would all these teachers from your prep schools in Hollister and so on want to come here there, so you wouldn't have teachers over there. Um, the, you've had all, all the teachers from your schools sign uh, as part of the signatures. Um, and I will admit to you, I'm, 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 I'm a little bit, you know, not particularly really excited about independent charter schools. I'm not I, I'm going to admit I'm not super happy with um, SEBA either. Um, I know, for example, that they fired a couple, a staff and a teacher, and they had no representation whatsoever. They were just gone. So that's not, I don't, <laughs> that's, I, I'm, I'm totally against that. Um, and I also know that Navigator School has we wouldn't be the first district that has denied you if we deny you. We would be, I know you've been, de I, I know you've been denied in Salinas. A couple of the districts in Salinas have denied you. And I know you have been denied, I don't know how many places in Santa Clara, maybe more than one as well. So, um, so there was reasons, obviously, there was obviously reasons why in all these other places, they have denied you. There's reasons. There has to be reasons. It's not, you know, you're saying that all the reasons that we have are completely erroneous or whatever. Um, these other places that denied you had reasons. Um, so I'm finished, I guess. <laughs> Jeff? Uh, Kev Kevin. Hi, Kevin. Kevin, I. I did some, I've done some research, as you know, and, and I said publicly uh, a couple of weeks ago that there is someone I know and I work with, a colleague of mine, who I really respect, and I mean that sincerely. I really respect her. Um, and she called me to talk about Navigator Schools and the great things you guys are doing in Gilroy. Um, and when she tells me to do something, I tend to listen to her because she's a lot smarter than I am, frankly. Um, and I also have called some board members, um, at some called some different trustees at different districts, not here, to talk about this. And I heard some good things about that. I heard, I heard some good things. So I, I was hoping to get a chance to go out and see, your, see a site. I didn't, because of my work schedule, I wasn't able to. Um, but as I'm sitting here listening to, and Kevin, if you want to come up to the, that'd be great. Um, 
There is no doubt in my mind that the people who are talking to us are passionate about it. I am even convinced that you're doing some great things. Um, I tend to be a pro-charter school. I think that everybody deserves opportunities to go to, to pick what's best for their child. Some people pick private schools. I think there needs to be some options for people who can't afford it, frankly. What really concerns me, and I, and I, and I really need you to talk to me about this, is I'm looking at the t-shirts, full disclosure. Um, I, am an, I represent Ap the Aptos area, Rio Del Mar South. Um, and so, and I'm not, I have not heard I was, sitting, I was starting to count how many times I heard this, the word Watsonville. I'm seeing teachers say, say Watsonville Prep. We're going to serve these students. We're going to serve this community. And there's a need to serve the kids in Watsonville. There's also a need to serve the kids in Aptos. We, we are 20% of the district. My understanding is, and I'm not, don't quote me on this. I'm looking at Joe. We, I think we have about 30 to 40% of the tax revenue. So we are absolutely, it is my responsibility to make sure that Aptos gets what, what it has coming to them. And so as I'm sitting here and I'm listening to Watsonville, 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 I'm waiting for somebody to tell me what's in it for Aptos. Help me. Sure. Well, thank you. Uh, Jeffrey for giving me the opportunity to respond to that. I'll say first that the attendance preference area is is something that is um, decided with the support of the district. So that is something that can often be addressed in a memorandum of understanding. So if there weren't exact 100 percent eye to eye on the boundaries that we uh, propose as our as having higher preference for um, higher priority preference. Um, that's something that we could discuss. And I'll say that the reason that we put Watsonville city boundaries as, our, as one level of priority before the full um, residents of PVUSD is that that would be a way for us to serve who we feel are the students that have the least access to high quality schools right now. So when you compare the scores of the schools throughout the PVUSD, the lowest performing schools are concentrated in the city of Watsonville. So that, that was the reason why we did that. that. That wouldn't mean that students that reside in the, in the Aptos area wouldn't be able to apply and potentially enroll as well. It just means that in relation to the, the priority preference, they would have a less likelihood. But again, that's something that could be adjusted. And then I'll just add a little bit more to what's in it for Aptos is, is that when you think about the broader community, and you think about even broader, like the whole county, and, and let's say even the state, that the more students that are prepared to be successful in college and beyond, it's going to help everybody. And so I'd say there's, there's also that community benefit as well. And, and I'm going to have our Director of Community Outreach also speak to this point, Kirsten Carr. So Kevin actually described why we did the preferences and that it can be changed in an MOU. But the other part where it would actually be able to um, benefit the children of Aptos and actually the entire district are what you heard from the teachers in our authorizing districts and the fact that we collaborate with all of the schools in our authorizing districts and be able to work together, whether it's through their professional development opportunities or whether they're in our classrooms, they can come to our, some of our data meetings, and that then does actually impact schools throughout the district and I do think you heard that from Dr. Flores when she um, sent you the letter. Um, as Kevin mentioned the reason we did put Watsonville in there is because of the fact that we do try to locate where there are the most underserved but that PVUSD is still listed as a preference. So what I'm hearing is that the students of Watsonville would, would get, get preferential placement and that we could change it after we approve this thank you yes thank you okay anyone else willie uh, thank you um a question came up um and and i and i want to want to put this out there because i think there's this feeling that watsonville high grads are not um doing much 70% of the Watsonville High School seniors go on to a four-year school or, um, or uh, some, some form of uh, college. Yeah. 
there's a, right there. <laughs> Proof right there. So, um, so the, the uh, question I have, uh, in the charter situation, we have uh, six of them right now. And one of the, one of, one of the th things that we really like about the uh, charter schools is that it gives opportunities for uh, being able to choose the kind of, kind of, you know, kind of school that you like to go to. What I'm, what I'm seeing in your outline is that the charters that we have here, parents are part of that uh, board, local control. Somebody said it tonight here, local control. And when I see your charter, that it's that there is no local control. We you you have you have one board for all three schools, and where where does Watsonville fit into this, or Aptos or anybody else? Is there is there going to be a local board for the Watsonville charter, or one for all three? And and I and I feel very uneasy sending over like one point two million dollars or whatever whatever that amount is without any local control right here for our own Watsonville Look, kids we don't have any representation in the larger um, navigator board from what I can see okay would you like to respond to that sir Yes, well, the first thing I would like to point out is that any uh, independent charter school that you approve, you have the ability to appoint a representative to that board. So that, that's a part of the charter school law, and um, that's something that you would have the privilege of doing if you are the authorizer. Now, if we get authorized through the county, that wouldn't be the same. Am I correct about that? Yes. So, so that would be one way to guarantee that you would have representation on our board. Um, currently, uh, Gilroy Unified and Hollister Un uh, School District, they send representatives occasionally to observe our meetings. They don't feel the, the need to actually serve in the board membership role, but that is their right. As far as representing uh, Watsonville on our board, we do have a member from the community, from the business community, Fia Omen, who's a member on our board of trustees, and I think Fia is here tonight, um, and she spoke at a recent meeting as well. Most importantly, though, I would say is that the parents are engaged in our school site council, in our uh, English langu language advisory council, through our parent-teacher organizations. There's a lot of representation in how the schools run with parents, and, and overwhelmingly our parents are from the community. So. I would I would add that as well. Well, I'm 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 uh, used to seeing uh, Alianza School is a good example of a uh, charter school of ours that is actually run by uh, parents, and I don't see that in your outline, the petition. Right, I, yeah, I wouldn't say run by parents, but parents are are definitely involved. We have two parents that serve on our on our board of directors. And two parents that are uh, representing both our schools right now uh, that are on our board. And I would like to ask Kirsten Carr to <laughs> add to this. Um, also in the charter, it does say anyone is able to run for the board. We also do have board committees, which parents are, um, can sit on, and then also then those are pathways to become a board member. We also do have parent surveys every year that our board goes through. The parents um, at any of the board meetings, they are um, video conference, so you can watch them at any of the sites. So Wait. Uh, What's your number of uh, board members do you have? We have um, nine. Of eight, the, eight, sorry, eight. Of the, of the eight, um, what would be the number representing Watsonville? Right now there is one so, before we've even been. So, oh, yeah. so that's my yeah. problem. It would be two, right. actually. Well, I just, I just want to add right there real quick is that 
our board represents all of our students wherever we are. And, and our, just like you, you represent a lot of schools. I don't know how exactly how many schools, a lot more than three. So our board is focused on two schools, hopefully three with Watsonville Prep. So they have a lot of time and attention on everything we're doing, which helps to drive our high performance. So I think our, our board, while there isn't majority of members representing a specific community, they are serving all of our students regardless of the community. And our, our board chair would like to add if that's okay. <laughs> I'm Katrin Wright, the board chair of Navigator Schools. I just wanted to address your concern. Um, I think our responsibility as a board member is to represent and serve all of the students. And so when you ask which one of our board members would represent Watsonville, I would say all of us on the board, if we were serving Watsonville students, would be representing Watsonville. On the governance committee. So if I may, I'm sorry, because we're actually out of order. Okay. So we're not allowed to have back and forth conversation with members of the public. So I will have to um, not allow you to speak. Um, but um, uh, representatives from uh, navigators can speak to those items as the board uh, addresses any questions. Okay. No, I'm just as a point of clarification. Uh, Kitchen Wright is our board president. Is that not? qualify as a legitimate representative of the organization okay so it's not just not back and forth conversation correct wait I'm uh, I had the floor and I'm asking questions and I uh, and I'd like to get some response from the okay. people okay but that is it okay if she finishes her statement Fine. Yeah? Okay. I don't care yeah that'd be all right thank you um, so one of the topics always on our governance committee agendas is how do we engage with the parents across our sites? What's our strategy as board members to be present? Just like you mentioned at the beginning of your board meeting about being present on school sites. Okay. Um, so, so I believe that it's important for a board to bring both a professional expertise needed to run a board like you all do, and also a deep commitment to every single student, every single family across the three schools that we would hope to serve. Right, but, 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 um, um, I uh, lost the train of my thought for just a second, you know, like a like a senior moment here. <laughs> um, so, so, so if if our migrant population needs representation, mm -hmm. how does that get to the board? I don't. Uh, first of all, in in your petition, I saw nothing about the needs of migrant. Uh, students, as I think that was already pointed out, but that concern, how does that transfer to policy to actual um, work at work at the school? So maybe can I address the question in terms of how we address it at the board level? Because mm -hmm. I hear you asking, how do we make sure we're hearing from all of the stakeholders in the group that we serve? Um, so. Similar to you, um, we have public board meetings that people are invited to come and make public comment to, but we also make sure that we are going to the community and talking to the people who are in the community that we serve. We also have a, a school site council um, and a parent uh, PTO organization where parents' voices are brought to the foreground. So I'll let, I'll let I think you uh, asked a question that's more about school policy that I should hand off, but at the board level, we have a deep commitment to making sure that we hear but, every single okay, parent. But but it uh, seems to me that the policies are are actually th that the uh, school is actually run by the staff with this idea about how to teach and so forth versus parent ma parents making decisions like out at Alianza school mm -hmm. and others that we might have can I ask one of the principals to address that question around how are parents involved in the instruction? Sure. Or one of the... Well, I would just say, I mean, the answer to your question and point right there is yes. We, are, we, uh, we have a staff that runs the school, and parents are involved in um, the already mentioned committees at the school sites. So but, that's but, but isn't a uh, charter school... 
um, set up on the premise that the parents are part of the um, part of the actual decision making. That that is one way that some independent charter schools do, and in our case, that is not the primary way that it happens. It's by our board of trustees has the governance, and then we have a principal, vice principal, much like a traditional public school. Uh, I'm 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 uh, having a, having a hard time trying to reconcile releasing public money to a to an organization that has no parental control as it was supposedly set up, and and if um, and I and I think somebody here asked asked that question today about salaries, et cetera, et cetera. And it, it would seem to me that I'm not in the mood to move over millions of dollars to a nonprofit or a profit. It doesn't matter to me th for that type of control. Well, I, I just say f first that we are nonprofit. And secondly, we have, as was mentioned earlier, two parents on our board, which is not always the case. In, for instance, a school board situation, you may, you may or may not have two trustees who are also parents of students um, in the school district. So I feel that our parents are very well represented in our decision-making processes at the board level and at the school level through our committees and other, uh, other parent organizations that allow parents to have strong voice. And as our board president, Katrin Rice, said earlier, we also review surveys that uh, parents have. And if a parent has a complaint, we're very responsive. Lastly, I'll just say is that we had, I don't know how many parents speak tonight, that are very, very happy about the type of school environment that their children have. So, 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 so if we have um, representation from Hollister, Gilroy, now Watsonville, and then, now we have three. Watsonville could be outvoted almost every every opportunity here. Well, I mean, every parent could outvote any day they want to by just disenrolling their student if they didn't think we were doing a good job for them. So, I mean, that's one of the beauties of charter charter school choice in the public how much, system. So, how much um, how much of a voice will a parent or the three parents have as to how monies are actually spent? Well, right now we have one parent that's on our finance committee and, and two parents that are on our board. So they have votes on all of our budgets. So they do have a significant input. Now that now also I'll mention that our local control accountability plan, our LCAP, which we're all responsible to have, also goes through extensive parent feedback and all of our budgets tie to our LCAP very closely in our LCAP goals. We had more than 90% of our LCFF funding was captured in our LCAP plan uh, tied to our five main goals, which meet all the state priorities that are required. So parents are very involved in that process as well. Okay. Kim? Excuse me, I have a little cold tonight so I don't sound like myself. Um, so I guess I have a question about um, your wait list, your current wait lists for both these schools. How many um, kids and families are applying to the schools every year? How many are waitlisted? How many get in via lottery? I'm going to ask Kirsten Carter to respond to that. The wait list um, varies from site to site, but at Gilroy Prep, it's over 500, and at um, HPS, it's over 300. And how many kids at each site there attending? Are there are 60 kids per grade, so 540 and 480. Oh, 420. 420. Mm -hmm. And how, how is the lottery handled? It is completely random. We, um, we actually uh, contract with an outside entity that does the random lottery. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm wondering if you all know how expensive it is to live on this side of the hill. 
So a lot of charter schools uh, are successful because precisely because of the parent involvement that comes with um, taking an interest in their child's education, being able to volunteer in the classroom and do fund development uh, for the charter. The population that you'll be working with largely are people that are just struggling to keep a roof over their head. Some of these families, including some of these members of this board, are working two and three jobs to pay our mortgages and pay our rent on this side of the hill. So the likelihood that the involvement will be there at the level that you're experiencing currently on the other side of the hill, I think, is slim to none. <clears throat> Although I, I can never be sure about that, but I would caution about, you know, around that because it's just nearly an impossibility. I'm a social worker in healthcare, and every day uh, I spend hours trying to negotiate bureaucracies to f try to find affordable housing for the patients and families that I work with. We're having a crisis in housing where we have families stacked up sometimes three and four to one small two-bedroom dwelling, living in garages with mattresses across the floor. That's what I'm dealing with every day. I, um, my son graduated from Pacific uh, Collegiate School, a charter, number one charter school in the nation, or it has been in the past. I don't know what it ranks today. And um, being on this board, I was very hopeful that um, being involved with Pacific Collegiate, that I could um, have some collaboration realized between that very high achieving charter school and this district so that we could share um, some common practices, and that's sort of one of the promises that you're making to our district, is to be able to share that. Um, unfortunately, even with my presidency, my high-ranking position here on the board, that, that just was not realized. Um, and the truth is, I think everybody up at Pacific Collegiate is so busy trying to realize their own um, success that there was no room or space to collaborate with anybody else in the county to share uh, perspectives, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not sure in a district this big um, how you could make that type of a promise to us. Um, I just don't see it being realized. We just had a retirement um, today for many people, and we have many openings in our district for new teachers. And I, I feel like if you have teachers that are so excited to serve deserving kids, I urge you to take a look at our website and apply for some of the positions in this district. We have deserving kids. We're hopefully going to ratify an amazing um, three-year contract tonight. Your benefits are completely almost paid for for you and your whole family, and you get CalPERS retirement. <clears throat> so I would encourage any of you that care about the Watsonville community to come to Pajaro Valley and teach the kids right here in our own schools. Um, I, I um, am very proud of the change that we've made in a superintendent. We've got one of the top superintendents, I think, in the nation. She was just recognized by the Broad Institute. And um, she's making the changes that we all wish to see in our district with innovation and a lot of the same things that you guys are doing in Navigator. So I'm excited <coughs> to realize some of the changes that she's made. And um, tonight, um, I do stand behind our staff and our superintendent's um, decision to deny this charter proposal. So I will be voting no. Willie. Thank you. <clears throat> Would like to ask about the, uh, the uh, facilities needs here. Um, what will be the obligation of our school district to provide facilities? If if we uh, granted this tonight. Would, would you like to answer that, Dr. Rodriguez? <laughs> okay. Well, so the, there's an obligation for school districts to provide uh, equitable facilities to charter schools under Proposition 39. So we have not waived our right under Prop 39. I will say that based on the limited information I've received from the district and I've heard at your meetings that it doesn't seem very likely that we would f be uh, greeted um, in a way with facility offerings that would really meet our needs. So we're under the assumption that we would be better 
serving, that we would better serve our student population by identifying our own private facilities to uh, lease and develop. And so that, that's our longer term plan. It's our shorter term plan as well. But it, it, it would be too early for us to, to f waive our rights to Prop 39 and we would like to know what the offering might be before we do so. It, it, it uh, seems to me, maybe I'm wrong, Michelle, that one of our charters um, began not with the uh, Prop 39 waiver and then after a year or two uh, demanded a, a facility which put us way behind in our, in, in our own budget. So is that, there isn't any way to guarantee that that's not gonna happen again. So first and foremost, as I've mentioned to the board, there's six specific things that allow us to deny the charter. So facilities is not one of them, and the use or non-use of Prop 39 is, is not one of the reasons for the denial or, or the approval either way. I will say that, um, <laughs> Because it is within the charter, um, they would have the right to invoke that, and um, it would not be in one location. We have done a needs assessment, and um, they would not be placed in one location because we do not have facilities okay. to house that many classrooms currently, and I have mentioned it prior. We have over 20 staff members um, just at the elementary level who are roving. There are our own staff that do not have current classrooms. And I'm being modest in when I say 20. Um, and so because of that, um, we do not have locations at one location where we would provide any type of facilities um, to anyone coming in. Right, right. So just a follow up to that, Michelle. So may I, Willie? Sure, sure. Um, so in the case that they did waive, um, they submitted the waiver and they acquire their own facility. How much would we as a district be investing in that facility? Well, it's all again, it, it goes back to with the fact that we want to engage with an MOU with them. The question is, is how much do we want to invest our time and energy into a charter school that is not a dependent charter school? Anyone else? Karen? Yeah, yeah, at this point, um, each of our charter schools are kind of unique, and um, we already have what you might call a prep charter school, SEBA prep. And um, most of our charter schools are dependent charter schools, even in, in that we work much more closely closely with them and obviously we, we we're not denied every single bit of ADA like we are from SEBA SEBA's taken away because it goes all the way up to high school now I mean we've been you know we've been I feel like hurt in terms of our ADA based on SEBA and it's an independent charter school and that we you know, their teachers aren't represented, um, they do their own thing, they, we have no oversight over them whatsoever, we don't work with them at all. Um, so I'm not really super excited about um, independent charter schools, and, and the fact that each of our charter schools are unique, you know, they, they, they provide something very, very different for the students, um, Pacific Coast, independent studies, uh, Alianza, Spanish Immersion, um, Watsonville Charter School for the Arts, complete, you know, art-oriented, of course. Um, and then we even have Linscott, which is the only other school that's not completely, um, it is a independent charter school, too, but it's a, you know, co-op kind of, a parent co-op kind of a school. Um, so... And we have a, we, like I said, we have another prep school. We have a SEBA prep, and you're going to be a Watsonville prep, which, you know, we already have, really. We already have a prep school, <laughs> if that's what, you know. Um, so I'm not impressed with your charter based on that, that we already have another kind of a prep school, if you will. 
Um, Do you have um, any questions, Karen? Of him? No, no, you don't have to be up for me, to be honest with you. No, you don't have to be up. No, you don't have to sit up, stand up here for me. No, no, thank so you. I do, uh, if I may, Karen, I do have a couple questions. So as a former migrant student, um, that's a population I care dearly about. Um, so what percentage of migrant students um, do you currently serve on your charter, charter schools, both Hollister and at Gilroy? I'm going to ask Sharon Waller, our Director of Student Services, to respond. Thank you. Well, um, at this point, we don't have any identified migrant students in Gilroy or Hollister. However, um, we've served students who are in other um, categories and at risk for academic failure, for needs, social emotional needs. Um, in looking at the population of Watsonville and the programs that we have, we feel very prepared to serve those students. The whole multi-tiered system of supports is designed for those students as well as others. It's looking at where are the students coming from, what are their needs, and how do we get them those needs. We will um, contact and be, uh, be part of whatever programs are in this district to support those students. We understand um, they have particular needs because they're leaving for months at a time. We have the right of return. Everyone on this team is committed to ensuring those students succeed. That's why we started the school. So they will be able to return. Yes. They will have their guaranteed mm -hmm. spot, regardless yes. of whether at that point in time you have those slots available. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I want to add, because we were talking about this today, is these parents that are here, you know, looking at the, your migrant goals, the migrant program goals for families, it's advocacy, so that's one of the top um, goals that your, your, the website mentions for the department. And the parents that are here tonight on behalf of their students, their children, are doing that. Like they've become these advocates for their children. Maybe they're not migrant parents, but these are parents who feel so strongly that they want a great education for their kids. So um, we understand the need for parents to um, be part of, part of um, wanting their kids to have a great education. And um, I, so I really appreciated looking at your migrant, the website, and what what that's all about. It's important to so, us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so with that, too, I was actually surprised that you excluded Las Lomas. Um, they tend to be one of the most disadvantaged communities, um, aside from Watsonville. Um, so it's to me, it's not as inclusive as I would have liked it to be. Um, and in addition to that, just by uh, the numbers that you share with us, with the, the, uh, the, um, the list of students waiting, wait list um, at the different schools, it, it, even an Aptal student wouldn't be, it's not fair to, get in, to, to, to be able to say that even if an MOU was to be written to include both Las Lomas and students from Aptals, <laughs> it would actually get a slot. It's heartbreaking. And, and, <laughs> right. And mm -hmm. in addition to that, your petition strictly focuses on the Watsonville population. Well, as one of the exceptions, but it, it is the whole Paro Valley Unified School District, though, is also has a preference in the charter petition. Thank um, you. Um, yeah. In addition to that, um, transportation. So I received an email um, in regards to the, your staff looking at uh, possibilities of addressing the transportation issue. Um, so can you elaborate on that? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, well, first, uh, we, we know we have obligations with our special ed population as needed for transportation. Um, there aren't uh, requirements for charter schools to provide transportation services for general ed uh, students. However, understanding um, the needs in this community, if that were a need that our parents identified, uh, we would absolutely want to figure out how we would be able to do that. So we've, we've accelerated our research in that area. Um, but to date, we still have not had one of our parent, one of our Watsonville prep parents um, state that concern. And that could be related to us not knowing exactly where we're going to be located yet. You know, I was um, excited to, to, to hear the fact that you're willing to work with different districts and so forth. 
uh, and that you have a track record of doing that. But I, I got um, the opportunity not to tour your school, but to meet with some of your founding parents, including one of the most active. I won't mention names. And it was really upsetting to hear directly from her the fact that she wanted her child to be completely excluded from the district, to have nothing to do with the district. And for me, if that's what one of your founding parents is saying about even the idea of building a partnership with the district, I don't know where you stand. You know, we, we hear one thing from you guys, and then we hear a whole separate um, uh, thing from parents, parents that are supporting right. um, the opening of Watsonville Charter School. Well, I, I, would, I would first say that our parents are first and foremost concerned about their own children having a great education. So I would say that's probably their, their primary concern. Now, as an organization, we are committed to having the biggest impact that we can in improving public education for all the students that we can have impact on. So we are deeply committed to that partnership, and we have more work to do with all of our new parents to embrace that same vision. Do you have another question, Willie? May I? Sure. Uh, was uh, there a response uh, about the uh, t about the teacher uh, student ratio? There there was some conflict between the uh, staff report and what the navigator is actually saying. So would you like to comment on that? I'm going to ask Chief Academic Officer James Dent to respond to that question. All right, good evening again. Um, so we start our first year, would start our first year at Watsonville Prep with six certificated classroom teachers and two additional teachers in training, bringing us to a total of eight um, certificated teachers on the site. Those two extra teachers are essentially rove in the classrooms and are being mentored, um, but are fully certificated. So when you take that, when you get the uh, ratio of that, it's 22 and a half to one in the first year and then reducing annually to bring the ratio to about 21 to one by year five. Well, the, the uh, report indicates that the um, ratio is actually uh, 30 to one. That is incorrect. Um, because of the two extra teachers in training, if you took just the classroom teachers, that, that would be the correct ratio. However, you added the other two uh, teachers in training, that brings your ratio down to 22 and a half in year one. We add additional teachers in training throughout the first five years until we get to five teachers in training, I think, by year five, which brings us to a ratio of around 21 to 1. Your teachers in training, is that different than the SGIs that yes. came up and talked? Yep. So they're non-credentialed um, interns or something? Or? No, they are, they are fully credentialed. Okay. They can take over a class. Um, the SGIs have essentially what used to be the requirement of 48 um, college credits. So there's definitely a differentiation in the amount of college experience and the credentialing. Okay. I'm just gonna um, do one last comment, everyone. It's done? Okay, so, you know, someone um, tonight mentioned that do not be afraid of competition. And I'm not afraid of competition. It's not about fear, it's not about competition. Tonight's decisions that someone also mentioned is about kids, not just 180 students, but all the 20,500 20, students that we currently serve. Um, we currently have six pilot programs in different schools um, showing amazing results of how we're turning around the education that's being given to our students. And I wanna rather than invest funds in opening a charter, is reinvesting those funds in areas of need within our community. So tonight, I will be voting no for those reasons, that I think we cannot give priority only to 180 students. Our responsibility here as board members of this public district is to invest in all 20,000. So with that, I would like to make a motion to approve the denial of this charter. Second. Approve. Approve the denial, denial. Means, it means that a yes vote. Right. So I just want to clarify. Yes, a yes vote, vote on the denial. 
on for the denial. Yes means no. Correct. <laughs> That's a good question. That's a well, good question, Billy. Really. That's a good question. Make sure we're voting on what we're doing. Yeah. So we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Yes. Aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Okay. Moving along to Okay, item 9.2, um, public disclosure, uh, disclosure of collective bargaining agreement between PVUSD and PVFT. <coughs> and our report will be given by our CBO, Joe Dominguez. Uh, good evening, members of the board. Um, this evening, I'd um, like to, with the action item 9.2, uh, is our uh, collective bargaining agreement um, uh, item that we need to have uh, approval. Uh, we have submitted it to uh, the county uh, and to review the impact of our negotiated terms with um, our, um, our teachers association. And so within the attachment, you have the layout of the impact of that. And just to summarize, that's 2016-17, a 1% a increase to the salary schedule effective on 7-1. Uh, 2016 2% off schedule, one time payment. 2017 18, a 2% increase to the salary schedule, effective 7 1, 2017. 2017 18, a uh, 6% additional increase to the early uh, childhood education, adult ed, and independent study salary schedules. And 2018 19, a 4% increase to the salary schedule, effective 7 1, 2018. And 2018-19, two additional days added to the PVFT work calendar. And finally, a 2018-19, uh, 2,500 signing bonus for teachers in special education, science, and mathematics. Uh, this will be in place through June 30th, 2020. Um, within that, you see uh, in the item in our multi-year uh, that we submitted that we, uh, the fiscal impact uh, of the agreement and that we met all um, with our minimum 3% uh, reserve and our financial obligations for the current year and outgoing year. Um, at this point in time, we also have Helen, uh, our Director of Fiscal, um, that can also address any other questions or um, from the board that you may have. Okay, so we do have a speaker to this item before we bring it back to the board for questions. Bill Beecher. Is your mic on, Mr. Beecher? I need to lean forward. Thank you. Um, I commend the district for working like heck to find a way to get raises for the teachers. However, there are consequences for the actions for doing that. And, uh, and I'd like to talk about that this evening. Um, when the negotiations were going on, my expectation was we would be able to get enough <clears throat> benefit reductions from the union to offset the increase in teachers' wages. That didn't happen. We did get a little, about $800,000 worth, and that's going to drive some cost issues that you're going to have to face looking forward. So these are the numbers that are out of the report, page 19, boring. Let's take a look at the, the bottom line. As you go through your years, wages plus benefits, we were at 86%, now go to 89, 
and we end up two years from now at 92.3% of your revenue will go to wages and benefits. That means you have a lot less money to spend on the operating budget. How did they get to this? Well, we'll see shortly is they had to cut $25 million out of that operating budget. Needs less books, less operating supplies, less everything. Because that's the only way you can make the, the books balance. <coughs> so this summarizes what I've said. Now, what happens to what if? What if a recession comes? We're 10 years into an expansion. We're way overdue for a recession. Even Jerry Brown's talking about it. If it happens, the only way you're going to be able to balance your budget is what you did in 2008. You killed your classified. We cut 28% of our classified people. It was brutal. So I would say, yeah, you did what you had to do, but you've got a plan that has a lot of risk on it, and you'd better pray there is no recession. And did you get a, any agreement that if there is a recession, if revenues drop, that the teachers will take a pay cut? I don't think so. It's not in there. And remember what happened in 2008 is we cut 3% of the teachers who retired early because you're, you're mandated by state law on how many teachers you've got to have. So that's why we killed our classified staff, and we're still suffering for it. So here's the cuts that have happened as we go through this budget. This is what you're taking out. This is what you won't have to spend in your operating budget. So what if? If the other spending cuts do not happen, the ones that they have in their budget, you'll run out of money. You'll go bankrupt. If they do happen, then you'll have to run the district with less. That's not a pretty picture for anybody. I believe in contingency planning. One of these is an idea that Trustee Yohiro has put forward, which is raises should be indexed. If revenue goes up, teachers get more pay. But if the revenue goes down, then their wages go down. Then you don't have to negotiate year to year. What you do negotiate is what is total compensation as a percentage of revenue. It's a fixed formula. Then there is no need to negotiate over wages and benefits. You just say, OK. Here's what we have to spend. Now, part of the problem that happened with this <coughs> is what they gave up in the health plan brings them down from a platinum plus plan in Obamacare to a platinum plan. And if you had to go out and buy your own platinum plan, you couldn't afford it. None of our teachers could afford it. This is a plan that's too big. I've talked about it being too big before you didn't get enough concession on health benefits, and you aren't going to be able to afford the cuts that you've just put into your plan. $25 million next two years. Good luck with trying to run the district. So thank you for your time. If I could clarify anything, I would, because you can't ask any other questions. Thank you. Thank you, I'll bring it back to the board. Do we have any questions or comments? Kim? Thank you. Willie? Uh, Kim, you, you want to go? The, the uh, budget, um, some uh, comments on it. The, the, um, the um, salary increases and all that stuff related to that, that's been approved by the fact finders and also the county and so that we uh, to uh, Bill's question, um, something happens, we should be able to survive the next three years anyway, according to the county. So as I had mentioned to the board previously, we would not have gone through what had happened 
what we went through and me put you in a situation where we are going to put the district in either qualified or negative status. So prior to going to fact finding, we for a third time had School Services of California completely do another audit of our books. We also had John Gray specifically look at the governor's proposal that is coming down for the 1819 school year and we are extremely confident that we can afford and will not have to do cuts. So 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 if we have a recession we're all in trouble again. So I think there's there's several different things that are different now than it was than it was prior. One is the fact that um, there is a rainy day fund for the state that there wasn't before. So I think that is that's that. Um, in addition, we do have um, the additional um, three percent reserve, which I know is affected by this, um, but we know that we're getting slightly more than was projected of discretionary one-time funds than what was set what was said in january so we're not getting less funds we're getting more funds and we are being fully funded for lcff which is important and the reason why we did the three year because it is using and i stand by this we cannot do ongoing costs without ongoing revenues and in this case, we do have ongoing revenues. The, the concession we made for the um, health and welfare does cover the cost to the district of the 2%, which was provided in the 17-18 school year. Um, and so I feel that um, we came to an agreement in which we can afford it. Um, we put priority with to our staff, which is what has been something I've wanted to do, you have wanted to do, um, without putting the district at risk um, financially. What about the towels? We actually <laughs> have information on that for you, <laughs> on the towels. I'm just, I'm um, just kidding. I actually have that information if you want it. <laughs> <laughs> the towels. There <laughs> you go. <laughs> so, so, um, Mark, do you really want to talk about it right now? No, no, okay. Because no, no, no. we do have it. We do have information on it. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, state law has changed um, with <laughs> policies, and that's one reason why we no longer can require kids to um, to shower. Okay. Kim. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> so. Um, According to Beecher's calculations, on, on the out year of year th three, ninety two point three percent total compensation. Is that an accurate number? So, on, in regards to that, takes in the total, both restricted and unrestricted. And for negotiations, districts in, uh, throughout California, we are negotiating on unrestricted dollars. And so, with this agreement, that brings us up to a little bit over seventy nine percent. Um, and so that's within the average uh, within the state. Okay, so the 92.3 is not accurate. 92.3 is total, so that also includes Oh, it is total. And does that take into account any, um, the fact that health care costs continue to rise? Like, have we projected that out over the next three years? So there's uh, different um, items that are combined within the restricted and unrestricted. Um, one of the major ones is special ed. Um, another component, um, Helen, you can other areas. All the grants and everything. But to answer your question, yes, we have a 4% um, increase in health and welfare projected for 1920. And then when we come to the board um, in a few weeks, you'll have 2021 on there also, which will have an additional 4%. So year, year, year after year after year, we're, yes. we're predicting about 4%. Right. right. <clears throat> okay. And the other component is uh, our STRS and PERS. And that contribution as well so that's also projected in the out years it it, it is for sure okay because isn't that going up like our costs are going up like 19 
around schools and see, you know, horrible flooring, horrible furniture, schools that need, and facilities that need, a, you know, improvement in infrastructure, et cetera. Um, with, with this particular contract in place, which I'm very pleased about, so don't get me wrong, but will there be any money left over to repair and improve our facilities? Or, and the next question is, for, for programming, you know, for, for the kids, for field trips, for things that actually, for band, for instruments, for new music teachers, for the things that all of us as a community care about. In regards, this, oh. in regards to facilities funding, there are multiple sources of funding. And so one of the things that uh, Helen and I are working on is doing a true assessment of all those uh, buckets of funding when it comes for developer fees uh, to our bond dollars, uh, deferred routine restricted maintenance funding um, and then looking at establishing a deferred maintenance fund which for a long period of time uh, I would say in 07 08 uh, throughout California districts swept that money when we implemented the local control funding formula it was an option that districts had at that point in time um, and using that within our LCAP and what does that look like for our district and so we're assessing all the facility funds to address those issues district-wide and there is a big need and then uh, I'd like to commend the board and the superintendent for also using one-time funds to invest back into our sites. Uh, so we'll also review and assess uh, that with the superintendent in regards to facilities funding. And then the second portion of your question was on? Programs and such. Just ec extra stuff for kids. And a lot of that has been addressed in the LCAP and those, um, that budget is already in our budget, so are in these numbers. So okay. There are instruments. There are. Um, We've made so much progress, and there's just hmm. so much more to do right. to go. Um, and then I look forward to the the matching dollars from uh, Prop 51, the bond, the, the state bond. Dollars. Yeah, which we haven't realized yet, but uh, I'm I'm hopeful about. Um, is there a provision? Um, you know, like is, like the state sometimes gives a cola, sometimes they don't, sometimes they do, but. Um, there is a COLA this, uh, for 1819. Mm -hmm. um, the state COLA is 2.71, and with the uh, little uh, increase in the funding at the state level for LCFF only, it's a 3%. Um, they augmented it a little bit. And there are, um, I don't, didn't bring it with me, but there are COLAs in the out years also, and they're over 2%. Okay, thanks, Helen. Thank you, Joe. Joe, I uh, I hammered your uh, hammered a strong word. I talked a lot to your predecessor about the Cadillac tax around the Affordable Care Act, and I haven't heard anything about it. That, according to what I was told, was going to be between three and four million dollars. Um, I keep hearing, oh, the law is going to change. The law is going to change, but it hasn't changed yet. So I think we need to go with what we know. Are we taking into account as we're, as we're talking about these, as we're talking about increasing our costs? Are we taking that into account? That that is the law, and I I, I believe it's going to start in 2019 or 2020. No, it's 2020. I thought it was extended to 2022. Right, was the latest. In 2020 is what I heard. Okay. So it's, it's are, we, are are we talk are, are we as we're making these commitments to um, individuals? Are we taking that into account? So it had, the um, has been postponed uh, for an additional year. And one of the things that we're looking at, though, is um, the superintendent and cabinet is looking at short-term, but also long-term uh, fiscal planning. And so one of those components is specifically that, is what is the impact of that? But we are looking at that item as well, but also, also the stirs and purrs, rising cost, and then just health care in general. I mean, I, I'm, you know, I, we need to give people raises. We, you know, we want to keep, keep our people. But we're also looking at some real increased costs, and so we really, I, we need to make sure we could afford what we're doing. I, I wasn't here in 2008, um, but I, there are still people with scars on their back from how it went down, and I really don't want this district to ever go through that again. And I just, I, was here. I just looked up the Cadillac tax. It has been delayed till 2022. So, and it keeps getting delayed, and our um, consultants have, you know. They're pretty sure that it's going to be um, repealed, but, you know. Well, I hear that, too. I was talking to a, a, some, a, a, a politician elected at the federal level, and he was like, oh, we're going to repeal this, we're going to repeal this. But You never know. I, until, it's, it's, until it's black and white, it means nothing. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. 
Anyone else? No? I am looking for a motion. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. So item 9.3, multi-year agreement with PVFT. The report will be made by Dr. Tony Lean, our Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources. I want to start with you. Two, just in case. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Is, is, is it like a, something to sleep with? She's so little. Shirt <laughs> on Thursdays, you know. So um, I will wear it on a condition of a couple of things. <laughs> we're, not, we're not negotiating. So this is, uh, this is my co-chief uh, negotiator, and uh, we're among the happiest chicks right now. Mm -hmm. So I made one of these for her, and we'll make it a little bit better. So I'm going to put it over the shirt. And it's a circle, and it says irresistible. <laughs> and so um, instead of resist, she's also irresistible. So I'm going to make one of those for her, too. Thank mm -hmm. you. I look forward to it. So thank you. Um, good afternoon, uh, Vice President Orozco, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, as you know, this is a joint presentation um, of the t uh, tentative agreement with PVFT presented by yours truly and Nellie Vaquera Boggs. She is a teacher at PMS and also the PVFT chief negotiator. And um, the agreement um, involved a multi-year deal from 2016 to 2019, including the following articles, and we will touch on each of these articles as we go along. And so I have introduced um, Nellie, and um, our negotiations team included our superintendent, Dr. Rodriguez, myself, Helen Balanzi, Joe Dominguez, um, Elaine Legoretta, and Allison and Terry um, were splitting the, the certificated HR piece. Uh, Clint Rucker and Brian Saxton, our principal. And for PVFT, it was myself, and Sarah Henney, Francisco Rodriguez, Leah Sugarman, and Greg Tucker. So the negotiations chronology, this negotiation started in December 2016. And by March 2017, the parties reach a tentative agreement on all Sunshine articles except for salary and benefits. Um, October 17th, uh, we resume negotiations and we also Sunshine organizational rights to comply with the new law AB 119. Um, PVUSD team shared two letters from the county office that warned against providing ongoing salary increases without securing ongoing revenue sources. Um, the, County said that this action would just uh, jeopardize the district's uh, positive financial certification. So the parties um, accordingly engaged in research to look for cost saving measures, which we found in some of the benefits and other resources of revenue. Um, the parties reached a tentative agreement on organizational rights in November uh, 2017. And by December 2017, we still had an item with the salary and the benefits, and PBFT had declared impasse. So <clears throat> in order to, well, Chona and I were new to the negotiations team as well this school year, and so we walked into a very contentious field. Um, and we, we, alongside with a slightly revamped negotiations team, just new different minds and um, at the table, we were able to start thinking of other ways to try to come together. Um, we did need the help of a mediator, so we did, when we declared impasse, we went into mediation, and at which in um, March, we then were um, recommended out to fact-finding. So in May, um, you know, we, it's, it was uh, a battle of, of wills, and, um, but we were all able to come to t together and, um, you know, with support of PBUSD, our superintendent, um, all, and PBFT, 
uh, and the Benefits Committee, that was really important. That was a major step, actually, is the Health and Welfare Benefits Committee when the district decided to start following the process. That was really important. Um, we were able then to, to start making some gains. Um, and uh, so, you know, we showed our flexibility and willingness to collaborate and reach a tentative agreement on all sunshined articles, including salary and benefits. And I am still a firm believer that our district can fully fund our health benefits and pay our teachers well without bankrupting you, because we don't want to do that. Oh. It's still me. Um, all right, so uh, one of the articles, actually this was one of the first articles that um, I think Chon and I, when we started this school year, this is the first one that we got to negotiate on. And this is Article 3, Rights and Responsibilities. What we did was we incorporated language um, that, was <clears throat> that had been passed in regards to, um, to being able to, for the union to have release time to meet with new employees. And, um, so then we had made sure that there is earlier notification for new employee orientation dates, compensation of newly hired unit members if new employee orientation occurs outside of a work day. So it was just language to ensure that our employees um, were having their collective rights met. Um, so changes to printing and distribution of collective bargaining agreement. agreement. That's a big one too um, because it's so important that every school site have a CBA or collective bargaining agreement. This is our, our guidebook basically for um, employee rights. And so it's important that all sites have that. So I'm, I'm, we're thankful that the district is going to, to ensure that we have that. So we also agreed on workload and hours. Um, and this included changes to language regarding site staff and administrative collaboration as it pertains to early release days, as well as faculty meetings and PBFT presentations. Another article is Article 6, class size, um, changes to caseloads to ensure alignment with statutory caseload maximum for resource specialist teachers. Sometimes they, ha they were inundated with um, more uh, their caseload was greater than they sh than it should have been. So now it's just we're ensuring that our RSP teachers or program spe resource specialists are having their rights met and that they're compensated when they are tempor temporarily exceeding their caseload maximum. It's the hard one. Yeah, this is the, this is the long one, so I'm going to stare at this thing over here. Um, all right, so this was uh, Article 7, Wages and Related Matters. This was the uh, big one for, for everyone. Um, for 2016-17, that was really important for our membership to have something on the salary schedule. It's important because we are, um, we provide a community service. And it's important for our members to be able to, when they retire, have a, a good pension. They're deserving of that. And so having something on the salary schedule is, is much better than just getting a one-time payout because over the many years, it's going to add up. So that's a 1% scheduled um, uh, on-schedule raise to um, everyone in our and PBFT with, um, that's on schedule, and then a 2% off bonus for those who completed the school year. And then in 1718, we're getting a 2% on schedule raise. And these are all retro to the beginning of their school years, which was also very key. Um, and alongside that, our um, adult ed and ECE uh, members are getting an additional 6%. Uh, so that's just wonderful since they're paid hourly, um, a majority of them. Um, the district will provide a bilingual stipend this was a big sigh of relief for many, and then sort of like a big question mark as well. Like, do I get it? Um, so it's wonderful. It's in, it's in our CBA that there is a stipend, stipend for bilingual um, teachers who meet the criteria, as well as, as a roving teacher stipend of 1612. And coming up on July 1st of 2018, the nurses shall be placed on the same work year and salary schedule as the psychologists. So Chona, if I may, before you continue, uh, we are getting close to 1030. So I will ask uh, a board member to 
I'll make, make a motion. I'll make a motion to extend our meeting till 1130. Thank you. Can we get a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. I feel for you all. <laughs> I'm going home after this. Um, for 2018 to 19, um, continued wages and related matters, a 4% uh, raise um, for the salary schedule effective July 1, 2018, and also effective July 1, 2018, two additional days. One is a teacher work day and the other is district determined. And uh, finally, for um, to recruit the hard uh, to recruit teachers, math, science, and special education, there will be a 2,500 signing bonus. The old one still. Uh, all of, this is good. Can I read this one? Then? Okay, great. All right. So, um, Article Eight, Health and Welfare Benefits. Um, this was really just language, but it was a really very important piece, um, the language piece for our C our CBA. And so that, um, so it was our health and welfare benefits. Um, they're subject to negotiations. And. Um, Contract language ensures that a comprehensive process is followed to ensure that adequate time to review complex changes for all parties to make um, an, an informed decision. So wanting to keep the equity, the jurisdiction, and a timeline uh, for, for our membership. Um, PVFT and PBUSD may only propose changes to benefits that were discussed in Health and Welfare Benefits Committee and the committee must make a recommendation before proposals, and then we vote on that and all that, and so before pro proposals are brought to the negotiations table. Um, so that is, they do that bef by March 15th. Those recommendations are done. Um, and then, very importantly, part of that timeline, that any kind of change that is recommended after that, it, you know, we start negotiating, it wouldn't ha be, um, imposed until the following year, so we'd have some time. Um, and part of what our membership did, Mr. Beecher, is agree to cost shift uh, 2% from, um, by, so we're, we're, we're getting the 2% in cost shift by our membership agreeing, as well as others that are covered by this insurance, um, agreeing to pay a higher copay and more in prescription. So there are ways to find savings without imposing a cut, um, a, a cap on benefits to teachers. So um, the next article is 12 leaves. Um, we agree to changes regarding sick leave and also wanted to make sure that we were in compliance with Ed Code 44977.5 regarding the child um, bonding provisions of CIFRA. Um, duplicate language was removed um, from, and there was also some clarifying uh, language with regard to uh, sections of the leaves article. Okay, and in Article 14, Reassignment and Transfer, uh, we added pre-retirement teachers seeking part-time positions to the vacancy placement priority list, so it's this timeline. Um, so that's what we ended up doing, is we aligned timelines um, for dates and transfer requests, you know, with transfer requests with our retirement t retired teachers. And with regard to adult ed, um, we did some changes to the status of retired adult ed teachers um, who are rehired. And as a result of the merger with the Santa Cruz County School District and the Pajaro Valley Unified School District Adult Education Programs, language was incorporated from the Memorandum of Understanding into the Collective Bargaining Agreement, including site seniority. All right, and lastly, uh, is retirement, that's Article 23. There's pre-retirement pre requests shall be submitted no later than March 1st for the following year. So that ties in with the previous one that I just spoke about. So they actually, those articles kind of tie together. So the changes were made to, con um, to contract language, language to align timelines regarding options for pre-retirement -retire and transfers. And that is our presentation, our co-presentation. Thank you. And thank you to Clint for such a nice PowerPoint. <laughs> we do not have any speakers to this item, so I'll bring it back to the board for questions, comments. 
Okay. Seeing that there's none, can I... They were changes to the sick leave? Involved uh, so that we were in compliance with CIFRA and the, the new child bonding laws. Dr. Killeen, Dr. Killeen, just for the people viewing at home, can you please speak into the microphone? Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the leaves article, the, the, the basis was to make sure that we were in compliance with the new ed code provisions, especially with child bonding. Um, those were new um, regulations. And we also removed some duplicate language and um, added uh, clarifying language to the leaves provision. Anyone else? I have a comment or a question. Thank you. Willie. Uh, the uh, comment was made uh, that the um, that there's that there's ways that we can work work on finding money in the uh, benefit area, and, and and I think that's absolutely absolutely correct. There's there's a way we, you know that we spend forty million dollars a year just on benefits. There there's ways that you can keep the benefits about the same and move some of that money over to the salary schedule. So let, let's um, work on that during the next year. I, I don't know if that's in the language or not, but we, we should be able to work on that through the uh, committee. Thank you. Make it clear to you, Mr. Yahiro, that what you have, or your friend here has proposed, um, is a cap on benefits and when we talk about cost-saving measures, which in the past, from what I understand, the um, PBFT has brought forth, um, I think, I believe that this, what we have now with CISC may have been brought forth by PBFT. I wasn't in, active in well, the union at that point. Well, but there have, been way, there have been, in the past, savings to health benefits because our membership, <coughs> our leaders in, the mem in our membership have brought that to the right. table what I what I uh, propose is um, wipe everything clean and let's start over let's let's look at options out there and and, uh, and and in no way am I trying to negotiate I'm just trying to open the door so that we can sit down and talk about these things in the future well there is a process now and I, th I feel it's pretty clearly uh, stipulated in our contract thanks to that language being you know, clarified, that Health and Welfare Benefits Committee has, a, has to come up with, they have their, their, um, their process, and then we can talk about those things. But you, know, you, you do make a good point, like let's, let's start negotiating in good faith, as opposed to being so um, combative. And um, teachers in this district enjoy being here, we have, you guys attended a retirement um, party today for people that were here for 40 years. That, that speaks volumes for people who are demonstrating their love of this district. So we want our teachers to stay. And if we're going to invest in them, that means that we're investing in them and not asking them to live a um, poor lifestyle or very like we need they need they should be middle class if anything agree. I agree so that we can we can uh, move the conversation on and all right <laughs> yeah because I'm it. I'm totally happy to talk to you about that okay okay thanks thank you all right so with that I would like to entertain a motion to approve the multi-year agreement with Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers can we get a second Okay, and then Kim has some comments. Um, I'm very pleased with the agreement that we have before us tonight. I know it's been a very difficult year on both sides. Um, I would remind you that as board members or people, we have children in this district. I'm a social worker. We have educators up here. We care deeply about all of you. We want the best for this district. We want the most excellent staff and teachers in the state. And we are, I am not kidding when I say that. So I am very pleased that we finally reached agreement. Um, it's been very painful, just personally, to sit up here and have, um, have you guys come in and sort of beat up on us as if we're against you, because we're really actually not against you. So um, I just, I'm very pleased that we've come to an agreement. 
and I hope to continue to move forward to have the best district in the state. Thank you very much. Okay, so with that, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Okay. Item 9.4, management employee and salary increase. Yes, um, Vice President Orozco, Board Trustee Dr. Dr. Rodriguez, reflecting our board's commitment to making sure that we're providing a competitive total compensation package um, to all our employee groups, both represented and unrepresented, the following increases and benefit changes are being requested for our classified and certificated management and as well as our cabinet. Um, the, the proposal is 1% on schedule uh, raise retroactive to July 1, 2016, a one-time off schedule of 2% to all management members who were employed through 2016-17. A 2% on schedule raise retroactive to July 1 and a 3% schedule raise effective July 1, 2018. Health and welfare benefit changes um, to become effective on October 2018. Uh, generic prescription drugs um, go from $3 to $5, non generic prescription drugs from $15 to $20, and copay increases from $10 to $20. Um, there are 111 employees um, that are certificated management, 34 classified management, and the cabinet positions include our superintendent, chief business officer, and assistant superintendents of elementary, secondary, ed, ed services, and human resources. Okay. So we do not have any speakers to this item or comments or questions. Karen? I would imagine um, that classified workers have a me too in regards to this contract as well, correct? Uh, yes, uh, Trustee Osmondson, they have a me too with regard to 2016-17 and we are currently negotiating 17-18 and 18-19 with classified right now. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm really glad that as much as I, it's important that we honor our teachers, my wife's a teacher, so I, you know, I, I try to honor her every day. <laughs> I'm also really glad that we're honoring our, our other members of the community, other members of the district, other working members of the district. Everybody is here to do what's best for the student. And so as important as teachers are, so are proper administrators. And so I'm very glad that we are honoring administrators for their, for their work. Uh, uh, Making a great district isn't it's not only about the teachers, it's also about administrators. So I'm very pleased with this. Thank you. We're going to, Maria, I was going to say one more thing. Karen? I just want to say what I'm super, super excited about adult education too, but I'm so excited about um, our child development workers. I mean, that they're getting. A much higher wage they deserve it so so much I mean I I've actually worked a portion of my life being a child development actually mostly director but I mean but, but I worked as a teacher as well in child development um, so I mean I see I see how important child development workers are to the success of our students ongoing as they you know as they get to one grade as they get to the grades up to kindergarten. So Karen, Karen, I I think we all are so excited that our child development workers are there. I'm get it so, raised, I'm but that's excited. not this particular item. The item in front of us is the management certificated yeah. oh, okay. management. So let's okay, go ahead and finish that. on this oh, item. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I'll vote. Uh, we have okay. To vote on that one. Does any? I'm sorry. It's going to take over. Again. Okay. <laughs> 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 I'd like to make a motion. Can we get a second? second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. Item 9.5, job description for career technical education counselor. <clears throat> Report will be given by Dr. Chona. Me again. 
Vice President Orozco, Board Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, PVUSD currently has a CTE counselor at all three comprehensive high school who is a county employee and contracted through an existing MOU with the Santa Cruz County Office of Education. The current county CTE counselor spends 90% of their time at PVUSD's comprehensive high schools and 10% of their time uh, at the county office. Um, to, sec to secure, in addition, this position is sometimes in flux depending on the staffing across the county. Um, to be able to secure a consistent and full-time CTE counseling services for PVUSD high school students, we're proposing this position to be within the PVUSD and hire someone as our own employee instead of contracting this position through the county office. Uh, the CTE counselor shall provide direct services to CTE students and um, in also in the development of their career portfolio and pursuit of college admissions, and um, be uh, communicate with site, district, county, and community colleges to assure communication and articulation of CTE course pathways. And the CTE counselor is responsible to use labor market demand data to reach out to local and broader industry partners to provide work-based learning opportunities for students and illicit industry to improve uh, CTE programs and this fits in with our goal of making sure that our students are college and career ready. Yeah, so we don't have any speakers to this item so I'll bring it back for the board for questions. Kim? Will there be one of these um, these educators or counselors on all three comprehensives? Um, we We're currently replacing these. We currently have one counselor that is responsible for all three high schools. Three sites. Um, but they're only 90%, 10% being in, with the county. And sometimes the county's um, staffing and their funding fluctuates. So we wanted to make sure that we have the counselor here. Um, we worked with PVFT to review the job description. And um, so it's one FTE as well. One, okay. one FTE, yes. And in, include, will this serve Renaissance also? Or Diamond? Uh, right now it's the three Just comprehensive. Just the comprehensives. Even though we hope to. Well, anyway, okay. okay. Pot potentially we can expand on that later. Okay, thank you. I'm in support. Okay, anyone else? Okay. Um, can I have a motion? I'll make a motion um, to approve the career technical education counselor. I'll Drop second. Description. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. Item 9.6, Resolution 17-1837, indemnification of the City of Watsonville for PV as athletic field project. And the report will be given by our superintendent, Dr. Michelle Rodriguez. Yes, so I'm happy to report that on Friday, May 11th, the appeal period closed for the Coastal Commission um, for that PVHS athletic field. Um, we were waiting till that time because we wanted to make sure that we did not put the district in any danger of possible litigation. Um, so that, that period officially closed with no appeals or objections. And so so our legal counsel worked with the City of Watsonville Legal Counsel in order to um, create the required indemnification resolution that we were required to do within 90 days. So we are well within the 90 days, but we did intentionally wait until the period passed um, for the appeal so that we, I could say to you that we have no, um, there will be no danger of being um, sued on the, on the project. So we are asking that you approve this resolution so that we can do the final step on the permit with the city of Watsonville. Okay. There are no speakers to this item. Do we have co um, board comments or questions? No? Okay. I'll make a Great. Let's go. I'd like to make a motion to pass this indemnification resolution for the fields at Pajaro Valley High School. Get a second. second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Item 9.7, approve resolution 17-1839, adopting best value procurement procedures and guidelines for lease lease back projects. And this report will be given by Joe Dominguez, our chief business officer.
All right, so uh, last time around we brought uh, two uh, uh, items uh, within the delivery method for the, um, for the uh, football field project. Uh, one was the lease lease back uh, method that we'll be discussing this evening, and the other one was a traditional uh, design bid build. And uh, on the uh, screen, uh, it shows the recommendation to move forward with the lease lease back uh, delivery method. Um, what this allows us to do is one, assist us in um, uh, with our timeline and cost savings. Uh, right now, we're still pending DSA approval. But using the lease lease back method allows us to uh, finalize our RFP and uh, solicit for contractors for the project. Once DSA plans are approved, then we can finalize the contract with that selected contractor. This evening, the resolution provides us to do the best value. So we're not only going to be focused on price, but also the, uh, the developer slash contractor is their experience, uh, expertise, um, their uh, ability to accomplish the project within a given timeline and or the um, background of the, the firm's uh, performance and safety record. So all that compiled together, uh, it kind of in a nutshell is the best value of that. So it's not solely just on price, it's also performance. Um, and as I mentioned, this allows us to go uh, sooner and provide an RP process, which we're working within our purchasing department and we plan to work with our facilities council and get that wrapped up. Uh, if the board approves this, we'll have that uh, completed by Friday uh, to be released throughout and then start soliciting for contractors. Well, that's soon. Yeah. We do not have any speakers. Any board comments, questions? Kim? Are there any um, developers in this lease leaseback option that are what we would consider in our local area? There are some. Um, it's going to be open to both local and non-local. Um, and w the benefit of um, the component of the lease lease back is also it lets us select an overall um, based on the items that I mentioned earlier. But it also builds a stronger relationship between the district and that selected contractor as they get to give some input and guidance on our architectural plans and um, and the constructability analysis. So they're more involved on the front end with the district. Um, so that's also a benefit. And so it's open to locals and or non-locals as well. Um, and once again, it's the timeline, uh, the cost savings with the general contractor. And then the other uh, strength that we'll be implementing is it minimizes our change orders. So because we're working with the contractor on the front end, rather than six months down the road, something pops up and there's a change order that was unforeseen. So the whole purpose of uh, this procurement process is to get those, so no surprises. And the, and the contractors that would be bidding like for the RFP for this, do, are they um, contractors that use represented labor? There are both, um, and so it's open, uh, but those are some of the things that we'll also look at within our procurement process. Okay, good. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, so with that, I am looking for a motion. I so move to approve the lease lease back method of um, putting this particular project out to bid in a way that's rapid and looks looks to quality. Hopefully. Second. Hopefully people here. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed, motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Item 9.8, adoption of resolution 171838, declaring futility to bid and approval purchase of child safety alert system. And that report will be given by Catherine Powell, Director of Transportation. Good evening, board and Dr. Rodriguez. Um, I was at the March 28th board meeting seeking approval for the purchase of the child safety alert system um, as a result of SB 1072 becoming law, the police safety school bus um, law. Um, at that board meeting, the concern was on the process, the procurement process and how that went. Um, and so I believe if I have the verbiage right, it was tabled. Um, and now we are back. Um, so I teamed up with Rich Ariano, our Director of Purchasing, um, to learn the proper procurement processes. And <laughs> um, 
he has joined me to discuss that process and the outcome of it. So I'll turn it over to you. Good evening. I'm Richard Ariano, the Director of Purchasing, and I'm going to provide some uh, background information on the process that we went through after the March 28th uh, board meeting. So the current statutory bid limit for procurement of equipment, materials, and non-construction services is uh, $90,200. Um, at the board's direction, March 28th, we were um, asked to issue a bid for the purchase and installation of the child safety alert system. Um, we issued that bid on April 5th, with all bids being due back to us on April 16th. And unfortunately, we received uh, no bids. We didn't receive any responses. So um, in order to meet the statutory deadline and to take advantage of the $27,000 grant that is um, in the Zonar quote, um, that is being offered to the district. Uh, we worked with our legal counsel to evaluate options to legally purchase the system and have it installed to meet the, uh, the deadline of the first day of school for 2018-19 where, where all these systems need to be in, in all of our buses. Um, so we did determine that the district has the ability to install the equipment itself. Um, and this system. would... Um, eliminate the installation component from Zonar's cost proposal. Um, Zonar has confirmed that it will train our staff and inspect the installations of the equipment at no additional cost, and Zonar has confirmed that the district installation of the child checkmate equipment does not invalidate the warranty for the equipment. So um, by procuring the compatible child checkmate equipment from Zonar, but installing it with the district's own workforce, uh, the district is able to meet the deadline for the start of 18-19 school year um, and take advantage of the grant. And by having Zonar train our staff to inspect the buses, we retain the warranty. So um, our recommendation is that the board approve and adopt a resolution declaring futility to bid for the child checkmate equipment and uh, for the reasons we provided. Yeah, um, so we do not have any speakers to this item, so I'll bring it back to the board. Do we have any questions or comments? No, seeing there's none. Okay. Do we, do we <laughs> truly have expertise to install this particular? Do we? Um, I am confident in my team, and uh, we will have uh, on-site training through Z Zonar. Mm -hmm. um, they will walk us through with schematics and diagrams for each type of bus that we have so um, that when they turn it over to our workforce, uh, they have ensured me that they will make sure they're confident, and I am confident in our team. So this is a $77,000 purchase. I think the original bid was 90 for the installation also? 75 for installation. Oh, an additional 75. Sorry, I missed 75 that. 75 okay. for installation, yeah. All right. So I'd really like to commend uh, Richard and Katie for um, looking at cost-saving measures. Uh, with and very competitive uh, we negotiated pretty hard with uh, with Zonar and uh, to get the price point that we felt comfortable with um, they are going to come back out uh, one piece is to certify the installation so making sure that we did it right so they'll come back out and certify the install um, and so we feel confident moving forward there um, I will stress that there is a stringent timeline that we need to meet uh, by law for the upcoming school year and so we have a, a window of time that we need to get this installation going. And so we are working on our schedule with our internal staff and that training uh, so we can accomplish it by the deadline. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow. So there is actually pending, litiga uh, pending legislation. legislation. Sorry, litigation, what is that? Um, that could extend the deadline for our regular ed buses. Um, at this point, the Senate is not willing to uh, extend anything for special needs buses. Um, but at this point, I think it's prudent for us to be proactive and just work off of the deadline that we're facing. I, I, I reached out to uh, Assemblywoman Anna Caballero and asked for some help if we needed it get, to get an extension on that deadline. Um, and, you know, and so she, I got the feeling she was willing to work with us, but you're saying we don't need it now. Well, I, I, I'm confident that we're going to have it entirely done by the start of school, the entire fleet. So no. 
So no. No, that's, I, that's, I think that's I think that's great. I think that's great. And I think it's frankly I think it's great we're saving seventy five thousand dollars. So I uh, have a motion to approve this item. Okay. Can we get a second? A second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? All right, motion carries. And now moving on. Thank you. Uh, and now moving on to item 10.0, consent agenda. I am looking for a motion to approve um, the items. Also move. And we get a second? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. Uh, we don't have anything under 11.0, um, 12.0. Uh, we do have some items under 13.0. Um, so I move to approve uh, the certificated report as presented by the district administration with four additions, two resignations, and one rescission, and one administrative appointment. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. I move to approve the classify report as presented by the district administration with the addition of one retirement. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? All right, motion carries. Under item, one second here. 2.6, uh, the board approved an MOU with Live Oak School District with PVUSD for one special education student. Um, and that's, I think, I believe that's all I need to report out on. Um, right, so it was five eyes. I forget the boat. So it's five zero two. Okay. And so with that, uh, meeting adjourned. Right. Well, I'm sorry, I was uh, told that that was the only item that I needed to report out on. Um, so under item two. I want to reject the okay, claim. Okay, so that under item 2.8, uh, the board uh, voted to reject a claim for damages um, for Keenan claim number 553165. And that was with a 502 vote. And so with that, meeting adjourned. Good job. Good job. Good job. Good job. Good job.